Broadcasting from deep within the heartland of free America, where liberty still shines bright. You're listening to On the Moon with Mac Worley III. Hello, MacPack. Thanks so much for joining us again. This episode is titled, Pull Your Money Out of the Bank. And I, I'm saying that with an exclamation mark. Uh, it's severely important, and I'm going to tell you why in a moment here. This is episode 103 of our program, On the Move with Mac Worley. I, of course, am your host, Mac Worley. And, uh, man, things are not looking great. So, before I, I cut into all of the, the economic stuff and all of this stuff for first let me just go through the, this week's uh, featured topics uh, for the first hour uh, if he's uh, still calling in I haven't got confirmation on this so I'm hoping he's going to call uh, we're having a former peace officer he's going to join us uh, today he's going to tell us his thoughts on uh, the modern police force he he was on and he has a, he has a unique perspective that I think we all could benefit from on the second hour, I want to have uh, Rick Halley. He's going to be joining us as a guest here. He's going to brief us on uh, what happened at the Olympia Washington uh, Second Amendment rally. Uh, that was, it was basically standing against the left's assault on liberty. Uh, they are, you all are familiar already. If you're listening to this show, you're already familiar with I-594 that was passed. Uh, I believe it was last year, potentially 2014, right at the very end of 2014. Um, and it was I-594. It's a very draconian gun law that basically makes it illegal for you to transfer possession, not ownership of a firearm, but possession. So in order for you to do that, you have to get a background check. You have to. So if I want to, as you, you, my friend, I want to hand you my gun and say, hey, look at this new gun I bought. I have to get a background check on you before we can do anything, before I can hand that to you. And if you hand it back to me, we then have to get another background check to give it back to me. All right. So first of all, the left already admits this will not stop anything and the criminals, they're not going to submit to this. So all this is going to do is an impede or infringe. That's another great word to use the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. Uh, and it will stop nothing. It will stop no crimes because, again, criminals, by the definition of the word criminal, do not submit to the laws. They break the law. That's what they do. That's why they're criminals. Um, but they're now taking it a step forward. Uh, they're going further. Again, this is a progressive agenda. This is what progressives do and stand for. They believe in disarming the people. They believe that the only people that should have guns are the government. And all of us, regular stupid folk, we are too dumb to have guns. We're too irresponsible. And therefore, we should be disarmed. But it's not palatable to do that all in one go. That's why they tell us no one's after your guns. Well, they're expanding it further. Rick Halley's going to give us the rundown on, first of all, what happened at the rally. And he's also going to tell us about what they're trying to pull in Washington. And um, this is all just a testing ground, folks. Washington appears to be the left's, the Bloomberg machine's anti-gun radical agenda to disarm America. And it's, it's all starting there. So what happens in Washington will cascade to other states. As we saw, SB 941 went to Oregon, and they're trying to do other statewide ballots all over the country, and they've had success in other places. So uh, I'm really looking forward to talking to Rick in the second hour on that. He's going to be calling us uh, five minutes into the second hour. Um, and then another featured topic we have, uh, we're going to talk about Obama now taking credit for low oil prices. Can you believe that, folks? Obama's taking credit for this. Uh, we're going to get into that. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the markets heading for a cataclysmic year in 2016. And that's not me saying this. That is the left, the statist. Uh, that is their sacred cow, the CNN folks over there at CNN Money. They're the ones saying that we're headed for a cataclysmic year. So, you know, don't believe me. I'm just a crazy conspiracy theory whack job who thinks that, you know, we're headed for a global economic collapse. But, but you know, what do I know, right? I'm just a guy with a computer who's, who's listening to experts on the economy tell us that things aren't, things aren't really what the government's telling us. They're, they tell us that the numbers are fine. Everything's good. Don't worry. You're secure. Keep your money in the bank. Everything's good. In fact, you should probably invest more because, you know, 
things are things are looking good. We just had a big drop in the economy. So throw your money in. It's only going up from here, folks. Don't listen to that. That is the worst advice. The next feature topic, alarm bells are ringing. Get your money out of the banks now. The, the collapse is here, and I'm going to tell you what you should look out for next. Also, I want to talk about how Walmart is closing hundreds of stores. Uh, and also, I, I want to cover how did people survive the Great Depression? We're going to get into that. Also, last week's topics carrying over to this week that we didn't have time to get to. I want to give you guys a rundown on what I think may happen with a Ted Cruz, a Ted Cruz presidency versus a Hillary Clinton presidency. And I also, if we have time, again, this is another topic from last week, uh, the global citizen movement. I'm going to explain what that is and, and uh, versus a realist global uh, geopolitical worldview and explain what those are and how they don't really coincide and where I stand. So we got a lot of other articles in the news we're going to cover, tons of other things. Uh, before we f- cut to our first commercial break, let me tell you an experience I had and why. I mean, obviously, you've seen everything that's going on in the news. We've had hundreds of points lost in the Dow. The market is currently crashing, as I have been warning you guys that it was going to the moment that they increased the Federal Reserve interest rates. So, again, this is a controlled collapse. They're doing it slowly, and they're trying to make you think that everything's fine. So, first, first, let me just tell you a story about what happened to me this week. Um, so, uh, you know, I took my own advice. I've been telling you guys for weeks now, pull your money out of the bank. Pull your money out of the bank. I've been I've been doing that myself, and I, I went to get the last of my money out of the bank, which I'm I am not a rich guy, folks. I, I am I am pretty pretty uh, middle class, I would say, low middle class, maybe maybe even b- below the poverty line, depending on the year. But uh, it, it just depends. But so I, I don't have a whole lot of money, and. Uh, just to, just to give you a heads up, I went to the bank and I was trying to pull money out of one account that I had at one bank and I was going to do so by cashing a check at another bank that I have an account in. And I took this ca- uh, this this check and I went to cash a check and they said, uh, we can't give you, we can't cash this check. We can't do it at all. I'm like, oh, wait a second. You, this isn't, this, this is not an astronomical amount of money, folks. All right. We're talking about a very little amount of money that uh, that I'm trying to pull out of the bank at this time. So anyway, so, so we uh, it, basically I, I'm talking with the, the teller and I'm like, well, can I deposit it into this bank and then try to withdraw the money then? And the teller tells me, no, uh, you can't get it all. We can give you some. So they gave me, it was uh, probably about 40% of the money that I I was trying to cash out of this check. They gave me 40% of it. And, and then they told me that because I didn't have the total amount of the check in my bank account with them, I couldn't withdraw the cash. So this, again, this is my money. This is, this is not, this is not their money. I'm not asking for a loan. I'm asking for my money back that I gave to them to safeguard and to make it easier for me to conduct electronic transactions so I can have access to my money quicker, better, no matter where I am in the country because I can access these banks and yada, yada, yada. You get the drift. So basically, uh, what I was forced to do, I was able to get 40% of the money with one uh, with a withdrawal right there with the teller, but then I had to go to the ATM around the corner and pull out uh, another $500, all right? And $500 is the maximum amount that you can withdraw from an ATM in a 24-hour period. So long story short, I still don't have all my money days later. Now, granted, they're telling me that this is a policy that they have and that this is this is how it is, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm telling them, I want my money. Give me my money. And uh, th- they're not they're not allowing me to get this. And this is this is crazy because it, it, though we we may not be to the point where it's like Greece, where they're limiting your your amount of money that you can withdraw from a bank account to let's say uh, four hundred dollars. I think is roughly what Greece is allowed to get out of the bank account per month. All right, people in Greece they're lining up around the block to get four hundred dollars a month out of their bank accounts. And at this point. Uh, I don't think that we're at that point yet. I think it's around the corner, but they're they're limiting how you can access your money with policy, making it like it's oh you know this is just this is not our fault. This is the policy. You just didn't plan properly. You just didn't do this correctly. I'm just telling you guys. 
I, I, I'm not putting another dime in the bank account that I can afford to lose, or that, that I can't afford to lose, rather. Uh, because I don't think that... It, you, you may still be able to access your money, but I think they'll they'll drag it over a long period of time. And this, I'm not alone in this. I heard a story uh, not too long ago. There was a, a bank executive that tried to pull $5,000 out of his bank, and they stopped him. They prevented him from pulling five grand out of his bank. I'm just telling you, gang, I, I really do think that we are on the verge of a global economic collapse. And I, and I don't just mean it's going to affect America. I think this is going to cascade. The, the, the markets are so interconnected now like never before. Every kind of uh, effect that happens in another country, it sends a ripple effect all through the global financial markets. And every market is interconnected with the United States. We are going to see a global Great Depression. I'm going to say that again. A global Great Depression. There will be no one out there to turn to. There's not, there's not going to be a new currency that's, that's already out there working. What I believe is that there will be a new currency that will be created to be the world currency. And I've been saying this for a while, and I'm, I'm pretty concerned about what's happening. So I'm warning you all now. Pull your money out of the bank now. Or you may not be able to get it. I'm not saying that it'll go away. It very well may go away completely. But I'm not saying that it will go away right at the beginning. But they're going to limit how much money you can withdraw. How much money you can spend out of your accounts. I think that's reason to be concerned. And I'm warning my friends, my family. Like I said, I consider you guys, you know, kind of distant relatives. You know, uh, you guys are, 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 are close friends of mine. And I really, really want you to know what's going on and I want you to take steps now this may not protect you against all things which is why I want to talk about you know what our 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 family did or our relatives uh, they did during the Great Depression what, what did people do to survive back then and that's one of our feature topics we're gonna to get to anyway we're gonna to cut to a commercial break and when we get back we're gonna be back on the line with uh, the former peace officer who's gonna tell us his thoughts on modern police forces today so you guys don't want to miss this we'll be right back Oath keepers is a nonpartisan association of current active duty military, reserve, guard, veterans, peace officers, and firefighters who will fulfill the oath we swore with the support of like-minded citizens who take an oath to stand with us to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So help us God. Join us at OathKeepers.org. Support On The Move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Latasha Worley, and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services, from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashaworley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. Broadcasting from deep within the heartland of free America, where liberty still shines bright, you're listening to On The Move with Mac Worley III. Hello, Mac Pack. Uh, we are back from break. If you would like to join today's program, the number to the show is 360-450-5625. Again, that is 360-450-5625. Or you can get us on Facebook at facebook.com slash on the move show. You can message us on Twitter at on the move show. We'll read your messages live on the air. If, uh, if you have something to say, please say it. This is your opportunity. Uh, anyway, uh, we are now joined by Mr. Jamie Brown. He is a 
a former peace officer, and uh, he's going to tell us his experience, what he thinks about the modern police force, and I'm really interested in picking his brain. Hey, Mr. Brown, are you there? Hello? Jamie, you there? Hey, caller on Skype, are you there? Caller, I can hear you, but uh, I don't hear you talking. Are you there? All right, there must be a problem with the line. I'm going to go ahead and hang up. Give us a call back, all right? All right, so in the meantime, gang, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, and cover some of these other topics here in the meantime. Uh, maybe he'll call right back. We'll see. But uh, I want to talk about how Obama is taking credit for low oil prices. And uh, this is something that I have been calling. I, I, I have been saying that he was going to take credit for this. And, uh, you know... It really doesn't surprise me. Again, I, like I said, I have I predicted this uh, because first of all, this is what Obama does. He takes credit for things that he had nothing at all to do with. So, without further ado, I'll just go ahead. I told you so. Oh, I told you so. I love that little clip. So, uh, Obama. Right now, he is saying this. Let me go ahead and uh, cue up the clip here. Obama has just taken credit for uh, the drop in oil prices. So, all told, over the past 59 months, the private sector has added about 11 million, 0.8, so that's uh, you know, almost 12 million new jobs. And that's the longest uh, streak of private sector job growth in our history. Meanwhile, our deficits are shrinking. They've gone down by about two-thirds. Our dropout rates are down. Our graduation rates are up. Uh, we're as free of foreign oil as we've been in 30 years. We're, we've doubled. First of all, that that's actually a lie. Uh, where are we as free from foreign oil? Uh, okay, okay, first of all, uh, shale, American shale, has has been decimated. You know, the, Saudi is currently trying to destroy the the American natural gas industry. They're they're trying to put it out of business, make it uneconomical to to actually produce natural gas in America. So, and Obama has been complicit with this. He's done everything that he could to to stop American coal, nuclear energy. He's done everything he could to ensure our dependence on foreign oil. He, he's made more regulations through the EPA uh, that, that make it more difficult to frack. All of these things have been an effort to hurt American industry. None of this is his, his doing. This is actually happening despite of his, his efforts. Double the amount of clean energy that we're producing. Uh, a lot of families are saving a lot of money uh, at the gas pump, which is putting some smiles on folks' faces. Uh, and, you know, you're welcome. I mean, it's, it's, although I was telling somebody the other day, at some point they're going to go back up, so don't start, you know, going out there and ignoring, you know, the mileage on, uh, on uh, when you're buying a new car, you know. All right, yep, yep, yep. All right, so... Again, he took credit for it. Uh, none of this happened because of him. And he's, but he's saying, oh, look, you know, uh, everything's so well, so you can thank me for this. You know, you, you can thank me whenever. I'll, I'll wait. I'm waiting for you. Waiting for you. But like I said, he, I told you he was going to take credit for this. I told you so. Oh, I told you so. All right, so... Uh, and and this is this is not a surprise. But what is a surprise is Obama is is kind of going against what he has previously said. Now, do you remember the debates back when Barack Obama was going up against Mitt Romney and they were talking about uh, low oil prices? Well, let's hear what he said on the economy back then. Mr. President, could you address because we did finally get to gas prices here? Could you address um, what the governor said, which is if your energy policy was working, the price of gasoline would not be four dollars a gallon well, here. Think, about what the governor, think about what the governor just said. He said, when I took office, the price of gasoline was 180, 186. Why is that? Because the economy was on the verge of collapse. Whoa, wait a second. This is 2012 Obama telling us that low oil prices mean that the economy is about to collapse. Huh. 
that's weird. What have I been telling you guys for, I don't know, months now? That the economy is about to collapse. We are in for some trouble, gang. And the fact is, by the way, uh, there is no actual floor being predicted for these oil prices. People were talking about gas prices being as low as a dollar a gallon. A dollar a gallon. I mean, that sounds great. I would love to be able to fill up for a dollar a gallon. That would be excellent. The only problem is, is that if Obama is supposedly right on here, uh, is that bad? Is that a bad thing? Well, it, it is for American energy. If we're trying to produce natural gas, those businesses are going to go out because they're really only economical if if the price of, of oil, the a barrel of, ga- uh, of oil is, I don't know, $80, $90 barrel as they were when they were really booming. Uh, but... Here's here's one good thing, I guess, uh, is that uh, there's a potential for oil to go up to $250 a barrel if uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia actually go to war. Uh, e- economists are projecting that oil could be as costly as $250 a barrel. That is just unbelievable. $250 a barrel. So since, since I got you here, you're a captive audience, so I'm going to bore you guys with some math here. So the other day, uh, you know, gas prices were about $30 a barrel, okay? And uh, I'm not great at math, so, you know, don't, don't, don't kill me if I get this uh, wrong or mess this up here. But at $30 a barrel, all right, let's, uh, let's figure out some, something here for, uh, at, at gas prices, the other day I saw $1.59, okay? So, uh, you know what, I'm, I'm actually, I'm going to skip this because I, I didn't do very well at math. So, <laughs> anyway, the point is, is that, you're going to see, you know, $15 a gallon roughly, I think is what I remember seeing from uh, an economist talking about this. If it is uh, about uh, um, $250 for a barrel of oil, that, that equates to roughly about $15. Actually, you know what? I think I might figure out how to do this here. So let us let me see. If we got uh, 250 we divide that by 30 which is the current price of oil. That's eight times, uh, 8.3 times more expensive. So let's just do 8 point, uh, or 1.59 times 8.3. That's a simple way because it's 8.3 times more expensive. So yeah, that's $13 and 19 cents. So yeah, are you, are you prepared to pay $13 and 19 cents per gallon? Imagine how that will affect the economy. So either way, there are negative sides. If we're too low for a barrel of oil, if it's too high, it's going to affect the economy. It's obviously going to increase transportation costs, obviously. Uh, it'll probably make uh, air travel only for the elites. Uh, you know, your food, that cost will be transferred to transport your food to the grocery stores if grocery stores can even afford to buy them. Imagine, you know, because again, you have, to, you have to realize that most grocery stores only have about three days worth of normal purchases worth of goods inside the store. So... You know, if, if they can't afford to, to in, make that kind of investment, you're going to see less items on the store available to buy, less selection. The prices for those goods are going to go up exponentially. I mean, it, it's it's going to be a huge amount of money just to buy a bag of groceries. You're talking about some very serious issues. So I, I want to link this in here to Obama's conversation where he was talking about uh, his is climate change efforts, how they want to regulate carbon emissions and all this stuff, with cap and trade. And basically, Obama was saying that uh, the prices would necessarily skyrocket. So all of these things going on while Obama is doing things like climate change agenda, where they're trying to tax carbon emissions and, and, and basically tax you for polluting. And I'm using air quotes here, folks, because polluting, all right, that, that's that's not really what we're doing by emitting carbon by any standards all right carbon is not pollution it's not a pollutant it's an odorless colorless harmless gas and you you create it every time you breathe out so in fact it's actually food for plants and the the whole idea in this climate change agenda is to to convince you that carbon and when they say carbon, they mean carbon dioxide, but carbon sounds dirty. It makes you think of coal, and you think of all the, the black soot that's around with coal. It just it, That's the that's whole part of it. It's a scam. So the whole agenda here is to convince you, first of all, that this is bad. Carbon dioxide is a bad thing. And they do this through, through showing computer models with data that's input in there that is flawed and has been changed 
and consistently it gets changed and changed and changed because their numbers are wrong and it doesn't it's it's been proven to be inaccurate their predictions so they put in the new numbers and they say this time we got it correct no okay not this time this time we got it correct and they continue to do this scam where they're convincing people that carbon increases the carbon dioxide they got me doing it now folks so carbon dioxide will increase the temperature of the earth that that's their scam that that's what they're trying to to perpetuate and i'll tell you as a college student i'm a college student i'm in college i took an environmental class and i i took issue with the fact that my textbook was telling me that man-made man-made climate change is a fact and it is happening because of carbon dioxide this is a theory uh, not a fact first of all and it's a it's a sketchy theory that no one can prove I, I challenge you any of your leftist friends ask them how many parts of carbon dioxide pumped into the atmosphere will increase the earth's temperature by one point ask them that by any percentage of a point ask them they cannot tell you because no one knows because this theory is just that it's a theory now I'm not saying that climate change doesn't happen. Of course it happens. We have a big ball of fire in the in the sky that happens to affect our climate pretty dramatically. So it's obvious that climate changes. Every time night happens, it gets colder. And every time day happens, it gets warmer. Huh. I wonder why. Could it be this big giant ball of fire in the sky? Perhaps. But, but also there's there's proof that climate is cyclical and and the idea that man-made climate change is, is pretty unfounded and this is not my words all right this is uh vladimir putin saying this he, he believes that climate change is an agenda that was created to to restrict the uh industrial might of the rest of the world to especially that of uh that of russia because their climate or, i'm sorry their economy is essentially swinging in the wind with oil prices. They are completely dependent on oil prices, which if you're talking about this global economic collapse, if we see gas prices at a dollar a gallon, how do you think that's going to affect Russia? You think they're going to have some problems? Right now, we've already seen, and I covered this on previous episodes, China's economy is having their own issues. They've had several corrections now. China's economy is not stable. It's not, it's not like uh, if something happens to the United States, we can all just go to China. Because if something happens to the United States and we go under, China's already having problems. They're struggling on their own. Without the United States, it's going to cause an enormous ripple effect that will take China out. It will completely destroy China. And if we see oil prices keep sinking as they are, both Russia will be gone and Saudi Arabia. And what's going to replace Saudi Arabia, by the way, if that happens? And, and <laughs> Again, this, this whole caliphate idea uh, about ISIS. You know, uh, Glenn Beck has been warning about this thing for years. And uh, he, was, he was laughed at, scoffed at, called an idiot. And... Uh, Seriously, uh, they're now they now hold a huge chunk of territory, uh, and this is all the fault of President Obama. His policy of of contain, and obviously his policy of uh, of funding, creating, arming ISIS in order to to actually destabilize and overthrow the Assad regime. So, it's, we are we are in a tight spot, folks. I will remind you. If you have money in the bank that you cannot afford to lose, you may want to consider pulling that out as quickly as possible. Now, I'm not trying to pur purport fear. I'm not trying to, to make you fearful about what's to come. I'm not trying to be a fear monger. I want you to be aware. I want you to know what is happening right now and what your government won't tell you. And I would argue that when your government says everything is fine and you have nothing to worry about, that's exactly when you should start worrying. It's not like they advertise global Great Depression. They're not going to tell you at all. They'll probably deny it while it is currently happening, which uh, we're seeing today. We have state-sponsored, essentially, economists that are saying, you got nothing to worry about. Everything's fine. You know, it, even though the, the unemployment numbers aren't really, you know, that great right now, and that's not even including what 
unemployment really is because so many people have dropped out of the job market. And if we look at labor participation, we're looking at 62% of Americans actually participating in the job market. Uh, right now, we currently have a record amount of Americans who are unemployed. Uh, 94,610 uh, I'm sorry, 94 million, 610,000 American are, Americans are not in the labor force. This is the lowest in 38 years. So they're telling us that everything's going to be fine. We're creating jobs, and the jobs that we are creating, they're failing to tell you guys that uh, they are low-paying service industry jobs. They're not manufacturing jobs. That They're not jobs that we're actually producing something that is of value. It's not, it's, it's all, again, this is all the easy money, fiat money scam. We think we can just, our biggest export, we thought in the 90s, was going to be economic advice. Who's going to take economic advice from us? Anyway, we got to cut to a commercial break, gang. Uh, when we come back, we're going to uh, dive in a little bit further into these featured topics here. I want to talk about uh, some announcements coming from Walmart. They're closing some of their stores and uh, give you guys some more of these, this info about the alarm bells that are ringing. So you don't want to go anywhere. We'll be right back. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic and that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, pledging my life, my fortune, and my sacred honor. So help me God. Join us at OathKeepers.org. Support On The Move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Latasha Worley and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashawurley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A Worley at gmail.com for a quote on items for your campaign. Broadcasting from deep within the heartland of free America, where liberty still shines bright, you're listening to On the Move with Mac Worley III. Wow, I just saw a picture of a gas pump at 99 cents a gallon. I don't know where this is at or if this is legitimate, uh, but this was uh, given to me uh, from a friend of mine, Dan Sandini. Uh, I just asked him if this was for real and where it's at. Uh, I'm literally blown away. This is insane. I t I I'm speechless right now <laughs> for a change. Anyway, um, so let's go ahead. Let's, let's go into some of the other topics that we have here. Uh, I want to talk uh, specifically about the collapse. Uh, what is coming next? What, what's around the corner? And what are some things that you should be looking out for? So the very first thing, you're going to see a drop, in my opinion, continued drop of the stock market. They're going to continue to, to see this thing bleeding out. And our government is going to continue to tell us that uh, everything's fine. You don't have anything to worry about because, uh, first of all, you must understand, at just the mere suggestion the, the, the possible suggestion when the Fed says, oh, we're thinking about an uh, increase in interest rates, the stock market tanks. And they know this. They know the effect that they have, what, what their predictions, the things that they say are going on. If they don't say anything that's, that's glowing, if they say anything negative at all, the economy to, the, or the stock market takes a dive because people are freaked out. And there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of panic in the markets right now. And there very well should be. There's a ton of panic in the in the market. So uh, let's let's go ahead and uh, 
uh, I, w- I want to talk about uh, the CNN article, first of all. Uh, there, it was talking about how this year, 2016, is supposed... And this is from CNN Money. All right, this is not me. This is this is the left sacred cow. This is the, the mouthpiece for status leftists. All right, it's the communist news network. All right, <laughs> they're saying that the markets are going to be hurting this year, and the, one of the 20th largest banks in the country is is telling all of their people sell everything, sell it all. And by the way, let, let's talk about that for a second, okay? Uh, with what I was talking about, if if what is coming, all right? Why why would you want to sell everything now? Uh, well, if you are considering selling something, if you have something that that something is not a value, like a stock, all right, that's just an imaginary thing. It's it's not a real thing. It's not something you can hold in your hand. It has no value other than the value that society places on it. And if society decides that thing is not worth anything anymore, then you're in a real heap of trouble if you still hang on to that asset, that whatever that is. So let me tell you, if you are looking to sell something, if you have a car, a home, a boat, an RV, which I would, I would say that if you have an RV, you should probably hang on to it. But all the other things, you should, uh, you should probably be looking to sell it. Because there's going to come a time here when things begin to tank and the prices for everything drops to nothing. And that's the time to buy. That's a buyer's market. Uh, and it's not a time to sell. So if you're looking at selling your house now and you, you, maybe you're just putting it off and you're thinking, ah, I can do that. Do that next year. Do that down the road, a couple months from now. I don't feel like doing it right now. If you're looking to do that and you need to do that and you couldn't put it off for, I don't know, 10 years, then you should you should try to do that now. And the reason why is what is to come. If the stock market collapses, it's going to cascade to the auto loan market. So your cars are not going to be worth anything. Uh, you're you're going to see prices for cars just drop dramatically. And then the housing market will do the same thing. So the prices for houses are going to drop dramatically. And why? All three of these markets, the stock market, the auto loan market, and the housing market, all of them are bubbles right now. And what do bubbles do, everyone? They burst. And let's let's talk for a second about why we are in the position that we are in now. All right, there, there were risky lending that was done prior to 2008. All right, risky lending. They were loaning banks were loaning money to people who didn't have income, who couldn't pay the loans back. And then they had these these kind of loans where they gave you a great deal for the first few years, and then it's suddenly you start having to pay more and more and more. And eventually, people went under, and they they couldn't afford this house that they bought that they could afford before. The idea was that oh well, in a few years I'll be able to afford that increase because I'll be making more money. That was the idea. And why were the banks lending this money? Well, the Obama administration, uh, for one, uh, they were forcing the banks to actually make these loans. The legislators, uh, legislators and Obama himself were forcing banks to make bad loans. And ba- bad loans are a real thing. If, if I'm going to... Just, just, the, and let's, let's put it on you. If you're talking about lending money to somebody... All right. Are you going to lend money to Joe Schmo who doesn't have a job, who has no source of income, who who's who's unreliable, he's got a bad credit score? Are you as a person, are you going to lend them money? Probably not. That would be a bad investment, especially if you're talking about, you know, interest on the loan and trying to make a little bit of money off of it. That's what that's the banking industry. That's what banks do is they they loan money to people and they make money from the loan. And there's such thing as good loans. So from you as an individual, if, if you're loaning money to somebody else and that person has a good high paying job, they're not, their bills are not uh, at or above the level of income that they have. They have a good credit score. They never have made a late payment on their life in their life. They've never gone bankrupt. They've never, uh, you know, gone, gone bad on their debts at all. They've always paid and they're responsible. That, that's a good loan. And I think you would agree that if, if somebody wanted to, to borrow some money from you and pay you back with interest, that would be a person that you would be happy to loan money to, if you had, obviously. But that, that's the banking industry in a nutshell. Is that's what they do. So the government forced the banks, and in many cases, they actually uh, litigated the banks who would not loan 
money to people that wouldn't be able to pay. They would not make bad loans. And the government sued them and forced them to make these bad loans. That's, that's how we got in that position. So they created, they created these bubbles. They created the stock market bubble. They created the housing market bubble. They created the auto loan bubble. And the, the chickens came to roost. And we saw, in 2008, we saw uh, the recession hit. And, again, the, what, the, what the left would tell you, President uh, Barack Obama, he's saying it's these fat cat bankers. They're the ones that are to blame. Well, uh, no. It's, it's you, Mr. President. I, I apologize. It is you who is to blame. You forced these banks uh, under the coercive force of government. You actually took them to court. Many of them that wouldn't go along with you. You took them to court and forced them to make bad loans. So, no, it's not the fat cat bankers. Now, they're not entirely blameless. I, I, will, I will tell you uh, that they are not entirely blameless. Uh, many of them were just trying to make as much money as they could. And you saw a huge increase in CEO, uh, CEO pay scales and things along those lines. But... Again, this wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the Obama administration. And if it did, if, if one company, one bank decided to make bad loans and that bank went under and there was no bailout, no guaranteed money coming from them from the taxpayer till, that bank would be done. That would be it. And all the other banks out there would see, okay, we can't do that because no one's going to be there to, as our safety net to catch us. And they would have to make smart decisions as a bank. So with the bailout, uh, not only did they, they prevent us from being able to fix the economy, because pumping billions of dollars into the stock market, taxpayer money, uh, TARP, where they're, they're bailing out all of these banks and you know, basically anything that ha is, is in the economy that's struggling, it seems like, uh, they, they basically just kicked the can down the road. They didn't fix anything. In fact, they just inflated, they reinflated the bubbles. And now we are currently seeing the fruits of that. They, they can't inflate it anymore. They can't keep this stuff artificially propped up anymore with other people's money. And as a result, they had to increase the interest rates. That was free money for these banks. Free. So why wouldn't they take it? Why, again, this is, just, this is encouraging risky lending. That's all it is. And uh, so now... We're seeing everything happening that should have happened in 2008 if our government hadn't stepped in and continued to prop up these, these failing sectors, these bubbles that had burst because of risky lending policies. If the government hadn't, hadn't done anything, we would be fine right now. The, the, the companies that were not doing good business practices would be out. We would have felt some pain. It would have been bad, but it, it's, it would have been nothing. Nothing compared to the kind of pain that we're about to feel now. So, the stock market's going to collapse. When that does, it's going to happen fast. Um, right now, it's happening slow because they did it slow. They did the they did the uh, the Federal Reserve increased just point, I think it was point two five percent of a point, uh, just a couple of basis points. It's not much. So. They did this in order to control the collapse. If they, if they pull the rug out from underneath the economy, it's going to be obvious. And they did this for one of two reasons. Now, I believe that they're leaving the door open for us to be attacked. I think that a terror attack in our country is imminent. I think that ISIS is being allowed to grow. They're calling it contained, but they're funding ISIS. They are arming ISIS. They're training them. And they literally created ISIS. By the way, Benghazi... It's still an issue. Hillary Clinton would have you believe that it doesn't make a difference. She says, what difference does it make anyway? It makes a pretty big difference because they were arming al-Qaeda in Iraq through gun running in Benghazi. I don't know if you guys are familiar. I think I've mentioned this before on previous episodes, but al-Qaeda in Iraq actually turned into ISIS. Hmm. That's interesting. It's also interesting that every time the Obama administration talks about ISIS, they refer to ISIS as ISIL. ISIL. Hmm. Anybody know what that means? ISIL? Uh, what's the difference between ISIS and ISIL? Well, ISIS stands for uh, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. Okay. Talk about these two places where they currently are. That they are in both Iraq and Syria. And by the way, they 
wouldn't be in Iraq if Obama had listened to his generals and not pulled out of Iraq the way he did. He just cut ties and got out of there. All right? We pulled all of our guys out of there after we fought long and hard to, to secure that area. What, what we had gained, the gains that we made, have been completely lost because of that. And the, the, the Iraqi army, who was funded and armed uh, by the United States, and they had uh, military-style vehicles. They had uh, up-armored uh, Humvees, and they had tanks and things along those lines. Armored personnel carrier uh, carriers, and uh, lots and lots of weapons. And what happened when we left Iraq? The Iraqis, they were overran. And not because they were outnumbered, but because they didn't have a will to fight. They didn't want to fight. Uh, so they dropped their guns, and who picked it up? Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And they changed their name to ISIS. And then they moved over to Syria and started uh, doing uh, attacks against the Assad regime. And our government is claiming that Assad is using um, chemical weapons against his own people. And Assad is not, first of all, Assad is not the one that did it. Uh, there's studies now proving that uh, the Syrian rebels, and, and in my opinion, the Syrian rebels are ISIS as well. Just a different name. A different name, folks. They're, they're saying that the, the, there's no way. Uh, I think it was an MIT study that was saying that there's no way that this chemical attack, uh, the missile could have come from Assad territory and that it came from the Free Syrian Army territory. And so that, that's, that, first of all, is not the United States government doing it. Uh, but second of all, it's, the, it's, it's problematic because uh, our government is trying to make it seem like the Assad regime is, in fact, uh, using chemical weapons against their own people and killing their own people, which is just not the case. Uh, but anyway, hey, we're going to go ahead and put a pause on this conversation. We are joined now uh, by a caller. Hey, caller, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is Kareem from Minnesota. Hey, Kareem, what's, I just, what's going on? I, I couldn't get the computer to work, so I wanted, but I wanted to hear the what you guys are talking about, so that's why I called in. Oh, okay. All right, you just want so to stand, hear the show. If, if, if you want to stay on the line, mute your phone, man. I, I'll, uh, I'll keep you on the line. All right? Okay. All right. How do I mute it? Uh, it's on your telephone. There should be a mute button. <laughs> anyway, okay. Anyway, uh, so as far as uh, what's going on with Iraq and Syria, all right, uh, ISIS, they they took over Iraq, or at least big big areas of Iraq, and they used the, the, the military equipment that we left behind for the Iraqi army. And um, so then they go over to Syria, and they start fighting over there. So that's where the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria comes from. All right? That's where that name come from, comes from. But what does ISIL come from? Where, where is that from? Uh, the, the name ISIL, it stands for the Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant. So let's ask the question, what is the Levant? What, what area does that cover? It covers a much bigger area than Syria it, and Iraq, by the way. It's, it, it includes places like uh, Saudi Arabia, I believe. There's, it covers that. Uh, parts of uh, Jordan, if I'm not mistaken. It, it definitely covers uh, Israel. So every time that, that ISIS, it, or every time that Obama acknowledges the name ISIL, He's, he's actually acknowledging uh, that they're, they're going to, as, as ISIS is telling us, that they're going, by using the name ISIL, ISIS is saying that they're going to control more territory. And the Obama administration, every time that they use the name ISIL, they are in fact acknowledging that they will cover more territory, which it very well may be true with, based on the current strategy of containment by this administration, which in fact is, again, arming, funding, creating ISIS. And uh, they're also training them. There's a CIA outpost somewhere in uh, Jordan, I believe, that is uh, training ISIS members and sending them back up to Syria. So all of this to destabilize the Assad regime, which is friendly with Russia. And... This is the proxy war that we find ourselves in. That's why I've continued to beat the drum that we need to get out of Syria. We need to get out of that area. That's not our fight, all right? N not our issue. Uh, I understand that if, if we leave the area and Russia moves in, which they have, they put in some uh, surface-to-air missile technology now that they pretty much have a no-fly zone control over that area. They are calling the shots when it comes to who's flying, and they can choose to shoot anybody down that they want. But uh, a lot of the people who are 
um, really tough on Russia. They're saying that we can't leave the area because if we do, it gives Russia a foothold in the Middle East like they've never had before. So, yeah, uh, that's concerning, obviously. But I would say that the bigger concern we have now is not, not on somebody who is uh, not a declared enemy of us. And going in to, to fight this, this, this battle will put us directly at odds the way with our current strategy. Our idea is to arm the rebels who are, in fact, ISIS and it's going against uh, the Assad regime, which is going against Russia. So this this whole strategy puts us directly at odds with Russia. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm pretty concerned about fighting Russia. I don't I don't have a reason right now to fight Russia. I'm not really interested in fighting Russia. But let's go ahead. And I was going to do this a few months back here, I think. And I was going to uh, compare the the fighting forces of the United States and the uh, the uh, Russian Federation here, their their manpower uh, and their military might. So Russia is currently ranked, uh, let's see, number two in the in total manpower, and the United States, of course, is ranked number one. So this is from GlobalFirepower.com, and I'm going to compare and contrast the uh, the numbers here. So. United States total population approximately 320 million, available manpower 145 million, fit for service we have 120 million people. All right, so let's compare that with Russia. Russia again, ours was 320 million. Russia's total population is 142 million. So we got them beat. We got a lot more people here. Available manpower Russia has 69 million. Again, we had 145 million. Fit for service Russia has 46 million. We got 120 million. Remember that. And uh, reaching military age uh, annually in the United States is 4.2 million. Russia has 1.3 million. Uh, in the United States, active frontline personnel, 1.4 million. Russia has 766,000. Uh, United States, uh, active reserve personnel, 1.1 million. Russia, 2.458 uh, million. So... They have uh, more active uh, reserve personnel so the, than, than we do by uh, 1.3 million or so. So let's, let's look at their land systems here. Uh, we have uh, about 8,848 tanks, and Russia has 15,398. So they got us beat in tanks. Well, what about armored fighting vehicles, the a AFVs? We got 41,062. They got 31,298. Well, Self-propelled guns. We've got 1,934. They've got 5,972. Well, what about towed artillery? We've got 1,299 of those. They've got 4,625. We've got uh, 1,331 multiple launch rocket systems. And Russia has 3,793. Now, they've got us beaten all of these land system areas. All right? All of them. Well, what about air power? We, we got to have more air power. Uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm not being sarcastic. I'm just saying we have to have more air power, right? Uh, so, United States, we got 3,892 total aircraft. I'm sorry, 13,892. And uh, Russia has 3,429. Uh, fighter, uh, fighters slash interceptors, we've got 2,207. They got 769. So, we're beating them on both accounts right now in the air power. Uh, fixed wing attack aircraft, we have 2,797. They have 1,305, so we're still beating them in, in when it comes to air power. Our trans, uh, transport aircraft, we got 5,366. They got 1,083. Uh, and let's skip ahead here. Naval power. Naval power. Uh, the United States currently has uh, a total naval strength of 473. And Russia has a naval strength of 352. We have 20 aircraft carriers, and they have one. We have 10 frigates. They got four. We got 62 destroyers. This is where we're really whooping their butt. Uh, they have 12. Uh, we got zero corvettes. They got 74. Uh, we got 72 submarines. They got 55. We have 13 coastal defense crafts. They have 65. We have 11 mine warfare uh, devices, I'm guessing, and uh, they have 34. And uh, let's go to resources. And this is where 
armies win. You, you've heard the saying that uh, uh, the, the battle for, is essentially fought in the belly. <laughs> you know, uh, an army marches on their stomach. So this is really important when you're talking about resources. You know, we got all these jets, we got all this stuff, but if we can't if we can't afford to you know fuel them, then we're in some trouble. So let's look at resources in, as far as petroleum. All right, um, oil production. We produce 7.4 million barrels a day. They produce 10.5 million, uh, b- I'm sorry, barrels uh, a day. So uh, 10.5 million barrels a day. So they got us beat by like three, over 3 million. Uh, oil consumption. Now this is going to kill us. We, pro- uh, we consume 19 million barrels a day of oil. Russia, 3.2 million barrels a day. So, they have a surplus of uh, 7.3 million barrels a day, and we, we only produce 17.4 million barrels a day, but we consume 19 million. So, we have a deficit of 12 million barrels a day. Uh, our proven oil reserves are 20.6 billion, and Russia's is 80 billion. So... That's uh, that's concerning. Something you guys should think about. Uh, let's see, logistical. Uh, let's see, our labor. For, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, our labor force is 155 million. Uh, theirs is 75.2 million. Our merchant marine strength is 393. Theirs is 1,143. Our major ports and terminals. Terminals is 24. There's a seven. We have we got them beat on roadway coverage. So if the war is fought here, we have the ability to rapidly move our forces around. Uh, we have a very large country, so they. So this is this is something to to, to point out. Uh, you know, I don't know about you, but I don't want to fight with Russia on American soil. <laughs> I, I don't I don't know about you guys, but I just don't I don't think that's a good plan. Just putting it out there, but. Again, think about this roadway coverage. Uh, roads can be used both ways. You know, it can be used by your enemy as well. So we have uh, 6.5 million uh, miles, I'm guessing, of roadway coverage, and uh, Russia has 982,000. So we got more roads by a long shot, about six times the amount, more than six times the amount of roads that they do. Uh, but again, uh, this is not the only factor to come into play here. Uh, railway coverage, we got uh, 224,792 uh, railway coverage, and theirs is 87,000. So we got them beat in railway coverage. Serviceable airports. Now this is just, we're going to destroy them on this. Uh, we got 13,500 uh, and 13 serviceable airports in America. Russia has 1,218. So we got them beat by like 13 times the amount of airports that they, they have. So financial, let's go over this last little uh, bit here. Uh, well, actually, let's, we got two more. Um, first of all, the United States, uh, we have a defense budget of 577 is that, uh, million. Yeah, uh, no, that's billion. 577 billion uh, for our defense budget. And Russia's is 60.4 billion. Our external debt is 15.68. That's not right uh, because uh, last I looked, we were uh, in excess of 18 trillion. So uh, we got 18 trillion dollars uh, worth of debt. They have, as far as this uh, this article is updated, uh, external debt of 714.2 million. I think. Let's see. Uh, no, that's well, that's billion. Okay, and yeah, we're, we're in the we're in trillions. A lot of zeros now, gang. <laughs> All right, so yeah, we got fifteen point six trillion. They've got seven hundred fourteen billion in in external debt. Uh, our reserves of foreign exchange in gold is one hundred and fifty billion point two, um, and theirs is let's see five hundred and fifteen point six billion. So they got us beat by almost. Uh, Let's see, almost like four times the amount of uh, of reserves in foreign exchange in gold. Uh, our purchasing power parity is, let's see here, uh, let's see, we got thousands, we got millions, billions. Okay, so this is 16.72 trillion in our purchasing power parity. Russia's is, uh, let's see here, uh, 2.553 trillion. And uh, lastly here, last category is comparing the size of the, the country. So if we're talking about invasion, obviously the smaller the country, the easier it is to protect. The bigger it is, the harder it is, the more resources it's going to take to protect. So uh, let's see here. We've got uh, America is uh, roughly, uh, let's see, 9.82 
uh, six million square land area. I'm guessing miles. Oh no, it's kilometers. Uh, nine nine point eight million kilometers uh, square land area. We have nineteen thousand uh, point or nineteen thousand nine hundred twenty four kilometers of coastline. Russia is seventeen million ninety eight thousand two hundred forty two kilometers square. They have thirty seven thousand uh, six hundred fifty three kilometers of coastline. So uh, we have more. Actually, they're bigger than us uh, on both. Uh, Square land area and coastline uh, shared border. Uh, we have 12,048 kilometers of shared border, and, and Russia has 22,407 kilometers of shared border. We have 41,009 kilometers of waterways and 102,000 uh, kilometers of waterways in Russia. So, wow, I just beat you guys to death with numbers. And first of all, I, I apologize, but I wanted you to understand. What I think is pretty important, uh, comparing the size and the uh, the efficacy of these these uh, countries, these two countries together, if we're talking about a possible head to head, look, the fact is is that if we are hit uh, in a in a Russian war, it's going to be, and it's interesting how things are cyclical because we had a Great Depression and then we went into World War II. What I believe we are heading into another Great Depression. This one global on scale. Well, no one will be free uh, of this, uh, and we are uh, we're ginning ourselves up in a proxy war against Russia, and all of the, uh, all of our greatest resources right now that we have is technology. We're beating them in air power. We got technology on our side. Like I said, we're beating them with naval power. Uh, we we got money, uh, but it's all fiat. And if the economy goes, there goes our big one of our biggest advantages, financial. And this will cut into our our actual technological advantages and our air power. Because you have to think, if we are asking the International Monetary Fund for money, if we're starting to to look towards global economy stuff to, to actually get help as a country, one of the very first things they're going to do is in order to uh, get collateral for a debt alone that we, we would have because our our economy I'm sorry our, our credibility as the United States is is frankly it's getting pretty bad so they're gonna ask for collateral and how they're gonna do that is that they're gonna either one tell us to sell some of our, our military technology to other countries <laughs> you don't think that's gonna come and bite us in the butt if we're talking about a World War three scenario and not only that, but they're going to ask us to sell our actual assets, our military assets. And one of the biggest assets that we have is our air power. That's going to cut into our biggest strategic advantage. So keep this in mind. This is something that we should be concerned about. Um, a, a war with Russia is not going to be an easy pushover fight. And I don't think that any of us actually want this, uh, that are paying attention. I think that our politicians out there, you, you have... Chris Christie and, uh, let's see, uh, Marco Rubio, I think. It, yeah, but basically all of them except for Ted Cruz uh, is essentially espousing the fact that we should be boots on the ground or really uh, aggressive or having a no-fly zone established in, um, in Syria, which is essentially saying that we're going to shoot down a Russian plane if, if, if it comes to that. And I just don't think that uh, fighting, even if, let's say, the, the, the narrative – that the Obama administration is purporting to us, even if the narrative that that the Syrian uh, uh, president uh, Bashar al-Assad, let's say that he is in fact killing his people, well, our administration didn't care about it when they were killing him with conventional means. Uh, when it was supposedly uh, called that that Assad was killing his people with chemical weapons, that's when he drew a red line in the sand and he ended up backing out of that because it was stupid of him to do. Uh, but they suddenly cared about it when they were killing with chemical weapons. You don't care about the hundred thousands that are dead when uh, when they're killing them with conventional weapons, but suddenly with chemical weapons, you care. My point is is that I don't want to fight for people who don't care about us, who who don't care about our values, our way of life, uh, who won't come to bat for us, and uh, that's just where I stand. And in my opinion, the, the Syrian people, they're not even willing to fight for themselves. It, right now, you see people that are fleeing into the, Europe. They're going north. They're trying to. They're leaving their country behind. Firstly, because you know ISIS is as bad as it is, and that's a lot to do with American policy on how we're reacting to them. And I don't have any problem with bombing the crap out of ISIS or even backing out and letting Russian uh, R Russia bomb the crap out of them. But again, we can't. We cannot trust our government to do anything right now. Uh, ISIS could be fought through the air. 
to be clear, ISIS could be decimated through the air uh, because they're fighting essentially as a state, as a conventional army. They have tanks that they stole from the Iraqi army. They have a lot of vehicles. They got weapons. They got headquarter buildings. They got all sorts of stuff like this. They have convoys that are moving supplies back and forth. They have all of these things that are right out there in the open that you could strike if you wanted to. But we can't trust our government to do that because our government, again, created ISIS, funded ISIS, armed ISIS, and is supporting ISIS. We can't trust our government to do this, which is why I think we need to get out of there. I, I would even be in favor of, of supporting Russia to destroy ISIS. I know that doesn't help us as far as Russia getting in the area, but again, I don't think that we can trust our government to even have any hand in, in Syria, so we should probably get out of there and let Russia take care of it, because they're the only ones that actually seem concerned about the stability of the Middle East right now. I mean, I don't trust them as far as I can throw them. I, I know this is a power grab from Putin. I understand that. My issue is that this is a power grab for oil, and we have a lot of oil here that we could be drilling. We have natural gas. We got fracking. We don't need foreign oil. President Obama is talking about getting off of the dependence of foreign oil. Well, keeping us in the Middle East is only ensuring that we're going to stay dependent on that because we're also in this at the same time preventing offshore uh, drilling. We're preventing drilling in Alaska. We're preventing fr like we're regulating fracking and trying to basically restrict any kind of oil drilling in our country. We can tap into the oil that we have here. That would that would be great for us. And if Russia is in fact building a pipeline and trying to control oil coming up from the Middle East, and they actually get a tighter grip on that market because they already have the pipeline going into Europe from Russia. But if they actually harness a pipeline going from the Middle East to Europe and they try to tighten the noose around Europe's neck and, and make sure that they, they do as they say, as Russia says, uh, then we should be available as an alternative to Russia so they don't have to do business with them. We should be the alternative, the answer to, to Russian aggression. That that's where I stand. But we have to cut to a quick commercial break. We'll be back uh, in a couple of minutes here. Uh, I have a lot more we're going to get to here. And uh, let's see. Uh, I want to talk about Walmart, some big Walmart news. Uh, and I have an article here that I want to get to on how our grandparents survived the Great Depression. So you guys don't want to go anywhere. And in fact, uh, we're going to be getting joined here uh, by Rick Halley in a couple of minutes. He's going to talk to us about the uh, Second Amendment rally that happened in Olympia, Washington. So you guys don't want to go anywhere. We'll be right back. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, pledging my life, my fortune, and my sacred honor. So help me God. Join us at oathkeepers.org. Support On The Move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Latasha Worley, and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services, from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashaworley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. Broadcasting from deep within the heartland of free America, where liberty still shines bright, you're listening to On the Move with Mac Worley III. Hello, we're back. It's the second hour of the program. I want to thank you all for tuning in. Uh, we are now joined by my good friend. His name is Rick Halley. He's going to be uh, talking about the Olympia, Washington gun rights rally. And uh, I want to get his 
pick on this um, really draconian uh, re legislation that they're trying to shove down uh, the citizens of Washington's throats pertaining to guns. So uh, anyway, without further ado, hey, Rick, are you there? I am here. Well, first, I just want to say thanks so much for joining us. Uh, and by the way, for those of you out there, Rick is part of the Gun Rights Coalition. You can find him on Facebook. He's got a, a group, a forum on there. You can uh, just uh, type in Gun Rights Coalition. You'll find him. Join the group. Make sure you say hi to Rick. Anyway, Rick, uh, first of all, uh, give me a heads up. What are they trying to push down with this new legislation? What are they trying to do? Uh, we've got there's there's several bills. Uh, we identified six different issues that they're covering with seven different bills so far uh, that are anti anti gun bills. Uh, we have safe storage of firearms, uh, extremist protection orders, assault weapons, and magazine capacity uh, ban and magazine capacity limit which are in the same bill, and then uh, destruction of forfeited firearms and a statewide ammunition tax. Oh, we also have, they're trying to remove the state preemption as well. The, the state preemption where uh, it says that basically no cities can make uh, more restrictive laws than what the state laws are, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Correct, so, yes. So, uh, first of all, you guys were holding a rally uh, to essentially stand up against this, and, and how did that go? Uh, what, what happened and what day was it at? Uh, the, the rally actually was this last Friday. Uh, we figured the, uh, you know, the first week of the session we'd get down there, uh, and get people to their representatives. And that was, you know, that was the whole purpose of the rally. We did the same thing again, or same thing last year. Uh, I think it was, uh, very successful. We had several representatives come out, uh, uh, a senator and, uh, uh, and then, you know, a number of other speakers as well that, that spoke uh, on the issues. Uh, two. Uh, following that, though, you know, the purpose was to get people to their representatives. So we uh, provided them with the information on, uh, you know, for some of them that, you know, with a lot of people, they just don't know how to get out and talk to their representatives. Uh, so we provided them with who the representatives were, where they were, gave them the information that they needed to take to them, uh, sent them with letters, and uh, off to the representatives. Uh, so and I think it was uh, another successful year. Wow. Okay. So, yeah, that, that sounds like a lot of fun. I, I wish I would have uh, been there, but I have a, a, a clip queued up here. Um, do you mind if I play a clip for uh, from Matthew Shea talking at your rally? Uh, sure. Go ahead. All righty. Here we go. And for Representative Taylor. All right. Uh, the next representative that I want to have up here. Uh, I met him, actually met him down in Vancouver. He came down to Vancouver for a, uh, a meeting with the uh, uh, Republican Liberty Caucus down there. The next day, the very next day, I was up here at the hearings on I-594 to help everyone. And that was actually, you know, it was really surprising. And the Gun Rights Coalition actually started because of that particular uh, uh, set of hearings. About three days before that, a few of us, uh, Bob is around here somewhere, uh, and several of the others that are involved here got together, shared information with each other, and managed to get about, you know, there were, I don't know, three or four hundred people at least that we were able to get here for those hearings, and it took only about three days to do so. At that point, we decided to put together the coalition so that we would be able to get all these smaller groups together. So that's kind of the story behind the uh, the coalition itself. Anyway, that very next day, I I, uh, I met him, talked to him for, for a few minutes up here. Since then, I've had several conversations with him. Uh, through the summer, this last summer, uh, I'm not sure how involved he was in the actual, actually getting the bill filed. However, he worked with me, uh, as did several of the representatives, to try and get the short barrel rifle bill fixed. So. Uh, with that said, we have Representative Matthew Shea. How's everybody doing? All right, I want to thank my friends, because you can't do this stuff alone. You just can't. I want to thank my friends, Graham Hunt, Jesse Young, Dave Taylor, Linda Wilson, Elizabeth Scott. And by the way, we got to get Elizabeth Scott into Congress and fix that mess in Washington, D.C., right? These folks work tirelessly, i got to tell you, they really do. But I start off every speech by saying this, our hope is not in man, our hope is in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And you know why I start there? 
Because our rights come from God, not from a bureaucrat or the governor. And it doesn't matter how much a bureaucrat tries. It doesn't matter how many executive orders the governor tries to enact as a dictator. It doesn't matter. They can never take them away. They can never take them away, and they never will take them away. I love Washington State because there is a gun in every home, behind every blade of grass, behind every bush, and that is what keeps us free, doesn't it? Now, some of the media don't agree with that. They don't agree with that. You know what? I'm tired of the media, aren't you? So become the media. We have social media. We've got Periscope. I think after this rally, we need to start interviewing the media. Why they defend the governor's policies that take away and want to take away weapons from law-abiding citizens. That want to take away the ability of those that live in poor neighborhoods to defend themselves. That want to take away the ability of battered wives to defend themselves. That want to take away the ability of women in our streets to defend themselves against rapists, muggists, and murderers. I want them to defend that before the American people, and we need to start interviewing them and making them defend their ungodly, unbiblical, and unconstitutional decisions and opinions. And it's interesting because I actually had the opportunity to interview a media guy. And he said, is it true, Matt? You know, he said, is it true, Representative Shea? Did you believe people should own firearms and have 5,000 rounds of ammunition in their house? As a minimum, yeah, that's true. That's true. But I want to ask you something. Are you saying people shouldn't be able to defend themselves in an emergency? Against people that would rob their houses and destroy their businesses? Is that what you're defending? Well, no, I didn't say that. So, you think people should have arms in their home? I didn't say that either. Well, then what do you? You believe what is your agenda and then I asked him do you think that maybe a hundred rounds per home is okay how many neighbors and friends do you have in your neighborhood that in an emergency you could give ammunition to so they could defend themselves isn't that loving your neighbor giving them the ability to defend themselves yeah, absolutely. you know what he didn't have an answer to that when he said next question interview the media become the media that's what we are as Americans we are the government yeah. The people. Amen. Let's reclaim that. Amen. Let's not let the media drive this narrative. We drive the narrative because we're patriots. And I got to tell you something. The other day, the Spokesman Review came out with an article, and I'm sorry, the Socialist Review came out with an article, and they said to me, and they said, they said, thank you very much. Let's cheer. That was great. The Socialist Review comes out with an article. Totally full of demonstrably false statements as they normally do. No surprise there, right? And then there's a death threat against me and my family as a result of that article. You know, it's kind of interesting that they accuse all of us of inciting violence and everything, and yet nothing ever happens when there's guns on campus with all of us here. It only happens when they write an article that we get threatened in our own homes and our families get threatened. Isn't that interesting that they're the ones that are inciting violence? Let's call them out on that. Yeah. Let's call them out on that. And i got to tell you something else. And I'm going to end with this. It doesn't matter how much they demean us, how much they make fun of us, how much they degrade us. I don't care. The Constitution is what unites us, and freedom, freedom is what is eternal. And I'm willing to fight my, to my dying breath to make sure that my kids and my grandkids Live in peace and prosperity and freedom. And not only may God bless all of you, but may we bless God by keeping America free. Thank you very much for listening today. God bless you guys. Wow. Yeah, I really wish I would have been there. That was, a, that was an awesome speech. Looks like a really good crowd. Uh, for those of you who want to check out the, the video, I posted it on all my social media, uh, except for Twitter. I haven't got around to that one yet, but check us out. Uh, Facebook.com slash on the move show or my Facebook page, my personal one or our uh, group on the move show. So, uh, Rick, uh, I, first of all, I, I'm I'm really bummed out that I missed this. You know, I I moved to Kentucky and I, I no longer live in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, I'm, I, I was with you guys in spirit. Uh, so uh, as far as how many people were there, I, I, 
I, you, I remember you saying there was like 200, 300 people or so. Uh, in, in this video, I see uh, a few kids in this. Uh, did you see a lot of uh, people bringing their children to this event? Uh, there were some. Uh, perhaps not as many as, well, some of the some of the rallies we have lots of children at. Uh, but it generally tends to be when the, when the weather's nicer. Mm -hmm. uh, it was raining, you know, pretty much the whole time through the rally yesterday. So it's, you know, that tends to that tends tends to keep uh, parents from bringing bringing uh, as many little ones out. Uh, but there were some there. There yeah. were some there. We had we had one one uh, actually uh, uh, Marie Marie, Marie Mc, uh, McFadden, uh, who is the leader of our uh, ladies group, uh, one of the leaders of our ladies group. I had her little girl there, and her little girl piped up uh, several times while the representatives were speaking, and uh, uh, and uh, and gave them assistance. Yeah, well, I think that was her that was uh, like, yeah, and uh, Matthew Shea was like, oh yeah, there we go. <laughs> he was mm -hmm. uh, he, he was talking to a little kid it that was. was cheering. I first of all, I just I gotta say, I love seeing when people bring their children to these kind of things and, and uh, let their kids actually get a first-hand experience on, on what the government's like. Plus, it's pretty cool. You guys are at the Capitol building, right? So uh, you're able to, to walk yeah. around the Capitol and, and show kids where their government is, is conducting business. And, uh, you know, I just I think this is one thing that we've failed uh, as a country uh, really it, doing because many people have been shielding and protecting their kids from this kind of stuff. And, and I, I think this is a necessary thing that that we have to do in order to maintain our our government uh to control our government keep our government small uh which is why you know we failed to do it so our government has gotten so big and out of control but uh I, first of all i just want to commend you guys for doing it, it going out braving the weather like that uh, i i know what it's like out there in the cold uh, cold winters in washington uh with it wet and just continuing to spit on you guys the whole time so uh you know kudos to you for that so uh, as far as uh, some of the other experiences uh, that, that you guys saw, uh, what were some of the notable notable things that happened? Oh, during the event, uh, you know, there. Again, you know, the most notable is that we actually got people to the table uh, to get their to get the the letters and uh, and find out where the representatives were and get to those representatives. So that that's. That's the uh, you know that's got to be the most notable and, and number one. The fact that we actually got people to do that uh, is is perhaps the biggest thing. Uh, we had uh, uh, Steve McLaughlin from uh, Liberty Watch uh, spoke towards the end, uh, and we didn't just discuss the uh, uh, firearm stuff, but he also covered some of the uh, issues we have with uh, with BLM and uh, forestry and whatnot as well. Uh, for those that don't know, we had some real big issues here in Washington with the forest fires. With trying to uh, to get volunteers and to help, uh, you know, people that wanted to help their neighbors and uh, they were turned away. And uh, so we're, we're trying to fix that. And then, of course, the stuff going down in uh, uh, in Oregon as well. You know, and that's part of the same issue. So yeah, we we were talking about that last week. Um, we'll, we'll get back to the uh, the event here in a second but I, I'm curious what do you think about the whole situation with uh, the the Bundys out there in Oregon uh, and the takeover of the federal building and stuff by the way is that still going on I haven't been following that uh, it is still going on uh, I'm going to I, I, I really prefer to decline to to uh, you know, provide a <laughs> a, uh, a position on it primarily because it is just so hard with what the media is doing uh, to really get a good handle on what really is going on. Uh, obviously, the, the the root and base story behind it uh, seems to be clearly an issue. Uh, well, I, I didn't even seem to be clearly. It clearly is an issue where uh, uh, the Hammonds have been done wrongly. Um, uh, so to that extent, I'm going to say, you know, I... I can understand what the issue is there. Uh, uh, what I'll, we're, all, we're all trying to avoid being involved in is is opining on exactly how they're going about doing what they're doing. Uh, in reality, it remains to be seen how that you know what, what that uh, turns into. Uh, so, so it, we'll just have to. Uh, for me, I'm waiting and seeing. Yeah, no, I mean, I understand, and, and I don't, don't, I'm not necessarily taking a, a hard-line position on this either way. As, as far as my concern on this whole thing, and, and 
we've we've talked about the rundown of it uh, last week. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, one of the Bundy sons, uh, Cliven Bundy's uh, sons, has uh, joined uh, some some folks over there. And they uh, have occupied a federal building in Oregon. I believe it's Burns, Oregon, and uh, they did it in protest of the um, of the uh, BLM's uh, uh, basically uh, prosecution of uh, these these this family called the Hammonds. And essentially, uh, they were there's some debate on on why they did what they did, but they were uh, doing some controlled burns, and uh, the, it got out of control at one point. Uh, but they managed to put it out the fire and it was uh, you know it's just a field basically of sage and they were trying to protect their property because the BLM property uh, does not uh, does not do these controlled burns and they uh, it's putting their own property at risk so they did this burn it got out of control and essentially they have been convicted of uh, terrorist activity uh, terrorism essentially because uh, a law was passed out after uh, the Oklahoma City bombing federally, that if you uh, start a fire on federal property, it's considered terrorism. Uh, so anyway, there's a five-year minimum sentence that's accompanying with that. And uh, the judge who initially sentenced them uh, sentenced the father to three months and the son to one year. And uh, then, it, you know, because he, he thought that, you know, this obviously isn't terrorism. Uh, it's not the spirit of the law, even though it is a letter of the law that a five-year minimum sentence. So... They serve their time. They're out. And now, later, uh, after they're out of jail, uh, the uh, the city is like, wait a second, they, wait a second, wait a second. They, they didn't serve the minimum sentence, and now they're going back to prison uh, f to serve the rest of their five years. And that is why uh, the the Bundys are now doing this uh, occup occupation. And so, you know, they're occupying this uh, this federal building with firearms, which is their constitutional right. They're, they're allowed to do it. Um, and uh, anyway, they're being peaceful. As far as I've had people, uh, somebody on the show last week, uh, Curtis, uh, Curtis Hart, he was actually there. He was talking to people, and they're actually fixing up the property. They're they're not destroying it like the Wall Street occupiers that were, you know, pooping and peeing on the sidewalks and destroying government property. Uh, they are, in fact, actually making the better uh, this property better. And by the way, so were the Hammonds. Uh, the Hammonds. Uh, there was a report uh, that the, the government even admitted that the property is now worth more in monetary value uh, after the controlled burn. So. That's the facts of, of what happened with this. And as far as my viewpoint on this, and I understand, Rick, why you, you're you hesitant to take a you know hard stand on it, but I think they have a right to do what they're doing. I just think from a strategic point of view, I think that they're, they're probably going about it the wrong way because the mainstream media is going to demonize anybody with firearms, as we have seen in the news with this, uh, which is brings us back to this event here uh, that, that you, uh, you put on for everybody in Washington here, uh, Rick. I agree with Matthew Shea on the point of becoming the media. That is what I'm doing here. That is what I encourage you guys to do. Don't let them silence your voice, and don't let don't let the mainstream media be the only ones out there uh, speaking about things. Because, you know, first of all, we have a right to, to speak our mind, and, and it's it's imperative that you do it now while it's still legal. Because that this political correctness nonsense is is going to be coming after you hard in 2016, and. Uh, it, I got a question for you about this event, Rick. Um, was it difficult? Did you have any issues with permits? Were they trying to make you n not uh, allow people to carry firearms? Uh, was there any administrative problems from uh, from the state of Washington uh, about this permit? No, no, and, and we never have had any in the in the past either. So uh, we actually, and, and you know, it was actually kind of nice because you know when, when we. Get, when we obtain a permit, basically what they're doing, what we're doing is we're setting aside that space to be able to use. We're not, uh, we're not necessarily asking permission to use it. We're setting aside that space, uh, and uh, and then the state is also uh, putting their hand in to help out and supply what they what they can for resources to make sure it it, uh, it works successfully as well. Uh, and so what we did this time was. Uh, uh, got with the got with the state, and uh, uh, usually I have to make a trip up to Olympia, which is you know, a 110 mile trip for me. Uh, this time, though, when uh, when Tony talked to me, uh, I told him, I said, Tony, how, you know this? I really need to try and avoid this trip if I can because you know it's 110 miles every time I do this, this trip. And uh, so we did it via the phone uh, this time, and uh, which was kind of great because they were you know were really willing to work with us 
so that we were working together. Uh, while we were there, uh, oh, I think I think there were three or four officers that were that were present, uh, uh, which is you know pretty normal, and uh, and they're there uh, to an extent to make sure that we're being safe, but also to to make sure that if we have counter protesters, that uh, uh, they're there to deal with that and uh, and and have them move on. So, so uh, I got I got a question for you then. Um, Hypothetically, if if you did have any issues, and I understand you didn't this time, and hats off to, to them for getting you that permit as well, we, uh, quickly as possible. But if you we did, did have a uh, we did have a Green Party person show up and started uh, started chanting up in the crowd. Uh, however, that was at the very beginning. As soon as I started talking, uh, you know, I'm still trying to trying to find out exactly what happened with her because uh, she became silent. Hmm. So. Well, uh, well, good for her for actually saying something as far as uh, speaking her mind, but uh, she may be misguided. But anyway, so, so if, if you did have some kind of issue getting a permit, I'm curious, uh, if if they denied you a permit after giving them advance notice, if uh, if they withdrew your permit, you know, right, right before the event or something, would you, uh, on principle, would you still continue to do the event or would you would you stop? Oh, I would do the event. I mean, well, yeah, you 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 know me well enough that, <laughs> to know that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, I would I, I would go ahead and do the event. That's our that's our land. That's our our government. Our our property there. Um, I think it's great that they work with us to make you know to make sure that it, the events come off successfully and that we're able to to have our voice. Uh, but if the government was to to try and stop us from doing that, I mean, um, it would be our duty to. To, to go up and speak anyway, uh, we would have to. Uh, I, I definitely that's agree. All there is to it. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. I just, I just wanted to, to ask because, you know, I, I personally, I and I know it, we've had conversations before about permits and stuff, and I, I, I know your take on it, but, uh, and I understand that the the rationale of asking for uh, for the permit in order to reserve the space and whatnot, but. My my issue with permits in general is is the idea that what one generation uh, allows, the other will embrace. So uh, that is an issue, and I find that the the idea that for a public space we have to we have to ask for permission. And I understand what you're saying that uh, that that you're not asking for permission; you're just you know getting the space reserved. Well, that's, that's kind of why I didn't want to make another drive up there. That just, mm-hmm. you know, uh, that's just at this point, you know, uh, with what it was, it was nothing more than than telling them that uh, that we were going to be there, and uh, and they did what they could to, to help us out with it. Uh, however, you know, start having to make a bunch of trips and stuff, and then that's you know, I'm having to start putting money out. Everyone else starting to have to put money out and stuff. Uh, we shouldn't have to do that. We shouldn't have to be have to pay for uh, pay to go speak on our own capital steps. Yeah, yeah, and, and I I absolutely agree. I mean, it's an, it's a cost in uh, in money of you driving up there. It's a cost in time, and that obviously takes you away from other endeavors that could be making you money. So, uh, but you know, for me, right. it's the idea of of asking permission because that's that is what a permit is, and whether or not you're you're using it to you know just secure a space or or whatever, you know, and and I I get why you're doing it. You just don't want any hassles, and I understand. You know, some sometimes you know not every hill is worth dying on. We. <laughs> I've said that last week, you know, and this is not necessarily the fight that you're trying to have on this. But again, what what one generation accepts, the next will embrace. And it's it's one of those things that I think this is is an important point to to note, because if you're talking about reserving public space, okay, uh, there's there's no issue. I don't have an issue if there's two events uh, that are going on at the same time i in a public space because it's a public space. If you wanted privacy, go to a private area. You know, get, go on private property, and you can have all the privacy you want. But you're in a public area. Uh, there shouldn't be anybody reserving space, which would imply that somebody else couldn't use the space. Uh, it's public. Everyone owns it. Everyone funded it. Uh, I just have a fundamental problem with that. But I, I mean, I understand your your rationale for it. Um, but let's let's move on. I want to talk about some of these uh, things at, that. Well, oh, go ahead. Sorry. At the, at, at the same time, though. You know, we're going to be there again Thursday, mm-hmm. and we're not we did we're not obtaining any permits or anything to do that. Uh, and you know, it looks like we could have a pretty good crowd there. Uh, we're going there for hearings, and um, and they'll just have to deal with who gets there. Absolutely, uh, they they 
They actually asked us about it on Friday. How many do we think will be there? Well, enough to make everyone uncomfortable, I think. <laughs> there you go. Well, it's, uh, and, and that's good. You know, I, I don't I don't have any problem with that. Just like I don't have any problem with like a Green Party person showing up and screaming and 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 using their voice. You know, it, you have a right to assemble. You have a right to to use your speech, and they don't have a right to make you have to get a permit to do that, especially on public property. Uh, but it mm-hmm. is, as far as some of these other things, I, I want to ask you. Um, specifics about these these laws that they're trying to do can you can you break down and explain what each one of these these uh, laws that they're trying to push through what it will do what they're trying to do and why you're against it okay well uh starting with the safe storage at the bit at the, you know, at the top uh with the safe storage uh they're trying to mandate uh uh safe storage of the firearms and that if they're not Stored safely, then people are breaking the law. Uh, especially if you know if something happened as a result of someone someone getting that firearm. Does it define safe storage? Um, like surface, what what safe storage is? Well, and you know, there with the way that the law is written, it's not real clear uh, as to what uh, because they, well, they've had problems trying to pass this in the past with trying to dictate too strict of you know of, of uh, regulations regarding what safe storage means. Um, so each year they kind of dial it back a little bit trying to get this through. Um, so at this point, it's kind of vague as to what safe storage really means. Well, that's concerning. Uh, however, it's it's pretty clear that, you know, what their, their purpose is is uh, uh, the mandate that all firearms that are, that are not under control be under lock and key. <laughs> Of some sort. Mm-hmm. Uh, the problem with that one there, and on the surface, it doesn't really sound like a bad, necessarily a bad thing. Uh, but we just simply don't need it. Uh, back in the 1980s in Washington State, we had around 15 people in the entire state each year uh, that had firearms accidents, accidents involving firearms that, that died from firearms accidents. In 2014, that number was six people. So and it's going that's down. About around, that's around where that number has been uh, for the last 10 years or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, it you know, goes a little up, a little down, but it's on average um, in half, cut in half from what it was back in the 1980s. So, so, so let, let me, let me play devil's advocate on already, that. Already are safety conscious. Let, let me let me play devil's advocate on that because the left will say, "Well, Rick, if it saves just one life, just one life, isn't it worth it?" What do you say to that? Let's be realistic. Let's be realistic. There were uh, approximately six hundred people that died from accidental falls that same year. There were. Uh, I can't remember the exact number. I think it was about 160 people that died from drowning that same year. There were somewhere around six or 700 people that died because of accidents involving prescription drugs. So the exact figures, are, I, I'd have to pull up to give you the exact figures on those. I actually started going through those today. Uh, but... Let's be realistic when we're talking about uh, safety and accidents. So, so what you're with saying, numbers, what, what, what I what I hear you numbers, saying is that we should ban heights, water, and drugs. I'm with you. I'm with you, Rick. Let's ban all those things, including guns, right? Yeah. If we're if we're going to if we're going to well, if we're going to mandate uh, the steps people must take to be safe with their firearms, then we need to mandate what they what they do with their household cleaners. Uh, we need to mandate. Uh, what steps that they take with uh, with their children when they go to the go to the pools and and uh, or just simply keep them from going to the pools uh, mandate that they buy storage lockers for their prescription drugs and you know on and on and on uh, because those are actual problems that are much bigger than safety with firearms. So so the issue here uh, essentially is that it's not really as big of a deal as they're making it out to be. 
be, we're talking about six deaths from accidental discharges in order to lock up a, a gun. And basically, they want to, they want you to have your gun under lock and key in a safe, uh, which, by the way, adds a, an increased cost. Do you, do you want a gun safe? And, and if you do, how much did, did you pay for it? It doesn't just add. It doesn't just add to the cost, but it creates a situation where that firearm is not accessible when it may be needed. Exactly. That's that's absolutely true. But you know, as far as the cost of it, I mean, guns themselves they already cost a lot of money. But if you add the increased cost of a safe in order to have it stored in a safe way, a legal way, uh, not only do you not have access to it to it when you need it, you don't have access to it uh, to prevent somebody from murdering you. So uh, we can argue, I would argue that probably people who have their guns in a safe, if if guns are required to be in safe, we'll probably see more than six people per year that die because they couldn't get their gun out of the safe in time. And and on top of that, you you are now denying the right to keep and bear arms to people who can't afford gun safes and people who can, they may only barely be able to afford a gun to begin with. So you're making it more costly to keep and bear arms. Uh, therefore, you're denying people a right based on income, which is something that uh, the left uh, really hates is when people uh, are, are disparaged because because of their their income level, this would be something that you would think that the left would be standing against. Because this is this is causing people who have lower income, and these are typically uh, minorities or, or or people that are, are struggling economically. You know, the, the the kind of people that the left likes to cater to, they're actually discriminated against them. What do you think about that? So well, I I absolutely agree. I mean, we can. And it's not as big of an issue here in Washington, but if you go to someplace like uh, Illinois uh, or New Jersey or New York uh, or you know several of those places on the East Coast, just simply the cost of invo- cost involved in just being able to uh, be permitted to go purchase a firearm causes an issue where these families that are struggling in this economy and and. You know, no matter what they say, there's still a lot of people struggling in this economy. Uh, these families who perhaps need it the most because they're the ones that live in the areas that are most susceptible to these crimes, uh, they are the ones that can't afford to do it because it means the difference between a month's worth of meals or more and having a uh, a firearm to be able to protect themselves if someone attacks them. And on top so, of that, yeah, you're issue. with a stroke of a pen. You're taking somebody who was completely lawful before, who's not harming anyone. There is no victim in this process at all, and you're turning them again with just a stroke of a pen. You're turning that person into a criminal. And as you mentioned, and I think that's a great point. The very people that are going to be harmed the most are the people who who are in these high crime areas who need these guns to defend themselves. So. It's absolutely despicable. So, so, what's the next law that you uh, you guys are opposing? Uh, the next one is the uh, HB eighteen fifty seven, which is extreme risk protection orders, uh, and that's another one that they've that they've put out that, uh, that on, on the surface doesn't necessarily sound like it's necessarily a bad idea. Uh, let's uh, you know, let's if someone if someone if, if someone thinks that they're under an extreme risk then they can go to the court and tell the court that they feel they're under extreme risk and an extreme risk protection order will be will be dropped and the person that is dangerous will not be able to have any firearms. Uh, well, the problem with that one, the biggest problem with that one there is, is the potential for abuse. We already know that there are a lot of people that make claims uh, falsely, uh, not only, you know, even if there weren't, the potential is there for them to do it, to make, make claims falsely, and there's no due process involved to make sure that they really are before having their rights stripped, or stripped away. Uh, additionally, we already have uh, laws on the books to where those with protection orders against them uh, are limited from having firearms in the first place. Uh, but even more so, even more than any of all the above, all the above arguments, is that this piece of paper is not going to keep a dangerous person from being dangerous. Mm-hmm. The 
only way that we're going to do that is to take that dangerous person off of the street. And that's the whole problem with a lot of these, you know, a lot of these, well, all these gun control bills is they don't actually keep people from being dangerous. In fact, they actually encourage letting dangerous people walk free. Uh, and that's a problem. It's, it's all, as far as I understand it, uh, it's the left's, the statist way of doing nothing while still feeling good about themselves. But in fact, what they do Correct. is actually not nothing. They're, they're trying to make themselves feel like, oh, look, I'm against gun violence. This is, well, these people shouldn't get a gun. But in fact, as you mentioned, and I would argue one of the most important issues here is the lack of due process. The, uh, due pro that's a guaranteed right. There has to be due process process. You have to have reasonable suspicion, probable cause, and actually reasonable suspicion is a Supreme Court uh, idea that came out of the ether, by the way. The, the, the actual standard was supposed to be pr uh, probable cause. That You have to have probable cause to search people. You have to have probable cause to arrest people. You have to have probable cause to restrict people's rights. And if they're a danger, as you said, and I've been pounding this drum forever now, uh, get them off the street. If you, in fact, do have reason to believe that they are dangerous, Dangerous because they've committed a crime or hurt someone else. The answer is not to punish the rest of the society because you're allowing these scumbags to go back out on the street. It's to keep these scumbags in jail until there's they're not likely to be a threat anymore. And, uh, and as far as I'm concerned, you know that burden of proof is on them. It's not on us. We don't have to investigate and figure out. Oh, are they are they going to be a threat anymore? No. They should have to prove that they are not a threat anymore once we've convicted them and they are sentenced and they're in jail. So. I mean, I completely agree with you. So, what's the next one, man? Uh, the next one. This one's this one's from my. Uh, uh, this one's from. I'm not going to call him my favorite representative. Uh, in fact, far from it. Uh, I perhaps may detest him the most of any of them. Uh, uh, Jim Mueller. Uh, he is. Uh, well, let's just say we have a little bit of history. Yeah. Uh, he put forth he put forth a bill uh, that is an assault weapons ban and magazine capacity limit, uh, similar to what you know New York and New Jersey and Connecticut, uh, similar similar to what they've done in those places. So, as far as the what what are they defining as an assault weapon and what limits on the magazine oh, capacity? Well, of course, you, of course, we all know that all of these new assault weapons ban. Uh, bills have have redefined what an assault weapon is, and we, we can you know I hear a lot of people. Well, it's not an assault weapon. You're right, it's not an assault weapon. However, when they defined it in the law, then that is what it becomes for purposes of the law. In this case, the the definition is such that uh, uh, if you have a pistol grip in the front of your life rifle, right, if you have a uh, a detachable magazine, uh, if you have a shroud that partially covers the barrel, and this one is a real problem, if you have a shroud that partially covers the barrel to keep your hand from getting burned, uh, any one of those features is considered an assault weapon. Whoa, whoa. Uh, assault weapon. Uh, okay, all right. We hold, already hold, know hold that all rifles, all, all rifles, have a shroud on the front of them. So, so, the front of them. So, so anything that has a detachable magazine, so even pistols, like semi-automatic pistols, are those considered assault weapons? Uh, I have to go back and read exactly how it reads to make sure that it, it doesn't accept uh, uh, pistols in the in the law. Uh, I'd have to read that again. The one, the one that I didn't ha even have to go any further though was on the shroud, the barrel shroud. Yeah. Um, at that point, you know, I didn't have to go any further because that's a that's a completely, you know, that includes virtually every rifle made. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but then on the uh, on the magazines, you drop back to uh, to the ten round magazine capacity limit. And that covers a huge range of, of uh, common handguns that people use. Mm -hmm. uh, 9 millimeter, 30, 380s, uh, 40 millimeters. A lot of those have uh, magazine capacities that are 12, 15, 18. Uh, and that would, that would include many of those. Uh, the bill is, is written. I, I'll have to, you know, I have to say this. The bill is written, and they've done this on purpose. 
to where anyone that owns these firearms already would be able to keep owning them. They wouldn't be able to transfer them, but they'd be able to own them. Uh, well, they do that on a purpose. And then they say they're not coming after your guns. <laughs> yeah. That's not true, because they still are coming after your guns. They're just doing it through attrition rather than coming after them directly. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and I completely agree. You know, it's especially as far as the redefining of an assault weapon. An assault weapon is defined as a weapon that's capable of select fire, meaning it can shoot uh, different uh, speeds of bullets. You can go from semi-auto to full auto or three round burst uh it, that is a an assault weapon and uh what i'm hearing now and this is new I, I haven't heard this before up until about a week and a half two weeks ago they're now referring to these uh to most other weapons as semi-automatic assault weapons so this is a, this is a clarification that they're making because they know that they're what they're saying is bs they they understand that what they're saying is wrong so now they have to clarify whoa whoa, whoa wait a second we're making up a new classification of something it's a semi-automatic assault weapon and what makes a semi-automatic assault weapon oh well basically any weapon out there that is a rifle uh, essentially if it's not bolt action you can't use it that's they don't want you to be able to use a gun period this is why i'm not for compromising with these these extremists because again it's a progressive agenda that it's not about uh, you oh, know sure. trying to compromise with sure. you it's about slowly whittling away at your right little by little because what one generation accepts the next embraces it get people to accept that it's an assault weapon and then redefine what an assault weapon is mm-hmm Absolutely. So, so what, what's the next one? Keep doing it until it includes everything. Uh, down to the next one, destruction of forfeited firearms. And, uh, and I, haven't, I haven't gone into this one as much looking at, uh, at what all it entails. Uh, However, basically what it means is that if, uh, if someone is arrested, their firearm is taken away, and, and you, know, you have experience with that, uh, I'm, I'm waiting with bated no breath longer, right now because this applies to me. So, so continue, please. Uh, yeah, yeah. Basically, if that far, oh, well, yeah, you haven't received yours back, have you? I have not. So, I'm I'm about to drop. Okay. A, oh, so, hell okay, no. So, so, this would this this would indeed sounds like it would indeed apply to yours as well. Uh, once that firearm is no longer uh, usable as evidence, it's destroyed. It's not turned back over, it's not turned over to the family, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, I would have to read that one there. We really need to have a lawyer look close at that one to see what it really means because there are a few exceptions there. Uh, but if you have an a, applied, if there's some application to get your firearm back, or I don't even know what that is. Uh, and that's and that's actually kind of strange because I had the I had opportunity to uh, uh, to deal with this exact situation this last summer when a family member had uh, had a uh, a handgun uh, taken from a vehicle during an arrest uh, and they turned that handgun over to me. Now, in that case, I didn't have to file anything. I didn't have to do any paperwork. Uh, they got my name, got my birth date, and uh, called me a week later and, and said, "Come pick up." So, wow. uh, how that would, you know, how that would have applied there? Uh, certainly, looking at this at this bill, it does not look like the same thing would have happened. I think that that firearm would have probably been subject to destruction. When are they proposing this to go into effect? Uh, well, these bills would normally go into effect, you know, I'm not, I, I think it's 100 days, 120 days after they're, after they're, uh, uh, voted on. I'm not precisely sure. I'm oh, my goodness. I'm precisely sure how, uh, how fast that they, they go into effect. Uh, I know it's not the same as, uh, uh, with the voting, uh, when, when we vote during, uh, during the voting season. Uh, like an initiative 594, that went in into effect at the end of December, uh, which I think was uh, 30 days after it was certified. Wow. Uh, so I, again, I'm not exactly sure when that would be. So, be so for those of you who don't know, I, I was uh, uh, unlawfully arrested in Washington State uh, in 2013 June, and. Um, by the way, I'm I'm going to go ahead and drop an update for anybody out there who who hasn't heard this yet. Uh, I've yet to really push this out uh, because 
uh, there's still some things that are up in the air. But I'll go ahead and do it right now for those of you who are interested. Uh, I was arrested unlawfully, uh, and they uh, they arrested me for displaying a weapon. Uh, initially, they arrested me for trespassing, although I was on a public sidewalk. Uh, that charge of trespassing never made it to court. They dropped it. But while I was in the cruiser, they later tacked on displaying a weapon in a manner, under circumstances, and in a time and place that could warrant alarm for the safety of others. And that law has been narrowed through the Washington State Supreme Court twice, first to a reasonable person standard, what a reasonable person would uh, would consider uh, would warrant alarm. And then they defined reasonable person. They, they defined it as a person who is aware of the law, knowing that it is legal to open carry. So uh, just the mere presence. In fact, this was a uh, jury instruction, jury instruction number nine, if I'm remembering correctly, that the mere presence, uh, or, yeah, the mere presence or the, the mere open carrying of a semi-automatic rifle in public is not illegal. This is what the jury was instructed. However, they convicted me. They found me guilty of displaying a weapon. And that has since gone to superior court. And guess what? We overturned it. We won the appeal. But we're not out of the woods yet. Uh, this is still an issue because the city of Vancouver is hellbent on continuing to to waste taxpayer money, and uh, they're filing for a review of the decision. So that's why I haven't uh, I haven't announced anything about that that yet because I'm it's still not done. It's there's a potential that this could uh, this could still be ongoing, and uh, they just won't drop it. They're they're dead set on uh, making an example out of me for lawful activity, and it just uh, it it blows my mind. So it, regardless how this applies to this conversation, they still have my gun. This is from 2013. I've already overturned the conviction now. They still have my AR-15, and uh, they, they've withheld it from me for this whole time. It's it's unbelievable, and now they're potentially going to destroy it. So that's great. I'm really happy about that, and considering the fact that I can't even vote or uh, you know encourage my uh, my my congressperson uh, to, to to vote against this because I'm not a, um, a, a citizen of Washington anymore. I moved to Kentucky. I'm doubly screwed now. So, uh, yeah, that's great. Uh, I, man, I really appreciate uh, that, that heads up, Rick. Um, but hey, uh, I'm going to cut to a commercial break. Do you mind if, uh, sticking around, uh, during the break, I'd like to talk with you some more about this. Sure. All right. I I'm going to cut to a commercial break so I can, uh, say my string of obscenities off the air. Uh, we'll be right back after this break, guys. Uh, you don't want to miss this next segment. We'll be right back. Oath Keepers is a nonpartisan association of current active duty military, reserve, guard, veterans, peace officers, and firefighters who will fulfill the oath we swore. With the support of like minded citizens who take an oath to stand with us to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So help us God. Join us at oathkeepers.org. On the move. Help us make this podcast bigger and better. You can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products. All designs are original and made for patriots like you. Just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show. We appreciate your support. Hi, I'm Latasha Worley, and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashaworley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A worley at gmail.com for a quote on items for your campaign. Broadcasting from deep within the heartland of free America, where liberty still shines bright, you're listening to On the Move with Mac Worley III. All right, gang, we're back. We are back. Uh, we're minutes away from the overdrive hour. We're going into the third hour of the program. Uh, we still have Rick Halley on the line from the Gun Rights Coalition. Again, you can find him on Facebook at uh, Gun Rights Coalition. Just put it in the search bar. You can join his group and uh, talk to other fellow patriots about gun rights and what you can do to stand up. So, 
Rick, you still there? I am. Okay. Uh, so, as far as uh, your take on uh, the destruction of guns in uh, in police custody, uh, forfeited guns, uh, why do you oppose this? I know why I do. Well, the firearms. I mean, this the the whole purpose of this is once again going back to the uh, uh, confisc- confiscation through attrition. Uh, what they want to do is try and keep as many firearms from going back to the streets as possible. Uh, no matter, and it doesn't matter what the reason is, they just would rather have them destroyed. Uh, current law, as far as I understand it, even when a firearm is uh, confiscated and not returned to the original owner, uh, it, it, there's the possibility of, of uh, sending it back to the family, or if that doesn't happen, it has to be uh, uh, auctioned off or, or sold off. Uh, so it it, you know, it goes back into the community for you know for those that need it. Uh, uh, whereas this, the purpose of this is just to keep, try and keep firearms you know out of society. Period, and that's the you know that's what they want to do. They want to get rid of firearms in society. So. Absolutely. I think that's actually one of the worst things about uh, I-594 is that it discourages people who are looking to get involved in firearms, who, who want to seek education and training and uh, try to try to go to the range and shoot, maybe borrow a friend's gun or, or uh, you know, something along those lines. Um, that it actually discourages people from, from entering into the gun community. Uh, and again, by by making people have to submit to background checks, which, which can cost money and usually do, and uh, you know, especially if we start bogging down the system and it it takes you know days, weeks, months to get a, a background check in time uh, to to actually go do this stuff, uh, to actually like go through all the systems and whatnot, the NICS, the instant background check system. If that system bogs down, I mean, you have you are literally preventing people from entering into the Second Amendment community, and it's uh, it, it it does it destroys it through attrition, which I, I agree. I think that that is uh, that's one of the biggest problems I have with uh, with I five ninety four, other than uh, you know the obvious, but uh, the that is one of the the surreptitious effects of this is that it actually discourages people from even getting into the gun community. Uh, it, so not only are are they destroying the guns themselves through through this legislation that we, we've just talked about? But they're also preventing people from entering into this community. And if there's if there's less people year after year after year, eventually that that footprint that that voice is silenced because there's less people speaking. So uh, anyway, what, what's the next law? Uh, well, this one here kind of goes right back to you know, just what you were just saying here. Uh, HB twenty three seventy four, which is a uh, statewide ammunition tax. This one's actually being fought in Seattle last year because the city of Seattle passed a, a, a city ammunition tax. Well, what they want to do is try and make that go to the whole whole uh, entire state. Uh, constitutionally, there's there's issues with it both on, on the federal and state level. Uh, they're trying to they're trying to call it a fee, but you know, that's not bad words. It's a sin tax is what it is. Uh, Every time you go out and shoot a bullet, it's going to cost you five five cents to do so. Uh, and not only is it going to cost you five cents to do so, but they're going to take that five cents, and then you're going to use that five cents in the uh, researching uh, how to further limit your right to keep and bear arms. Um, and the the problem with it is that you know, they're not actually dealing with the causes of violence. Uh, and trying to actually correct the problem, uh, they're just trying to discourage people from using firearms. If it's going to cost you five cents a, a shot, you're going to be less likely to own a firearm. Even more so, you're going to be less likely to go out and get the proper training you need uh, to use that firearm. Uh, you know, and if you're, you know, you, you want to use your firearm defensively, uh, you know, you're you're going to shoot a hundred or two hundred. 200 shots uh, in a day doing so. Uh, so we're talking, you know, we're talking a hundred bucks here uh, just for a day's worth of shooting, just in this fee alone. That's not including the cost of the ammunition itself. Wow. So, so that's gonna, that's really gonna discourage people from getting the training that they need. 
the real purpose of a pellet is to kill the light itself and discourage it. Exactly. And, and I, you know, I completely agree. In addition to discouraging people from even getting involved with firearms and going out and seeking training and because of the, the, the discouraging cost associated with it, uh, this is obviously a redistribution of wealth scheme. They're, they're basically uh, trying to take away money from this group of people who, are, by the way, are constitutionally protected to do the right that, they, that they're trying to do by shooting ammo. Um, that, but they're redistributing it into government hands. This is the government taking money from one group of people in order to punish them for unlawful activities. Now, here's the crazy thing is that, you know, criminals, they don't typically buy their guns or their ammo, most likely, uh, from legitimate sources. So the people that are, in fact, getting punished by this tax are the people who are following the law, the law-abiding citizens. And, in fact, the, the criminals are still going to be out there doing it. They're just going to find a way around it, uh, find a black market to access it, as they're already doing. But more importantly, and this goes back to a previous point, this hurts the poor in, in more than one way. Because, first of all, it, the poor aren't going to be able to afford the firearms. So they are, uh, again, being discriminated on against uh, because of their income level, which they're, they're making this so only the wealthy are going to be able to own firearms. And uh, in addition to that, as you so eloquently pointed out earlier, again, if you're making it more more costly for people to have firearms. People in low-income neighborhoods are going to be less likely to have firearms and the ammo associated with it, which in turn is going to mean more people in these low-income housing areas are going to be victims of violent crime because they couldn't afford the firearm or the ammunition associated with it defending themselves. It's unbelievable. And in, in this case, the left is literally targeting the, the majority of their constituency that they depend on. And it, it blows me away that they, th these people are supporting their own chains being put on them. What do you think, Rick? Oh, I agree. I agree. And, and a lot of these people don't realize the whole reason that we didn't have all, any of these gun control laws uh, until they wanted to start, and, and, it, and it goes right back to the slavery days, they wanted to start restricting black people from being able to own firearms. Uh our a wedding, uh, wedding, uh, where we go get uh, uh, licenses for weddings. Same thing. We didn't. We never had to license weddings until they wanted to restrict or limit black people from being able to get married. It's part of the same issue that all started as a as a, a way to limit uh, black people and minorities from being able to have the rights and. People don't see that today. They don't realize that that's that's really what this is and what 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 they're doing. You know, I wonder if so, we can use. I wonder if we can use their own uh, precedent against them here. Uh, it, it, and I'm saying like case law precedent because uh, the Supreme Court just recently said that uh, it, if. If uh, there's housing areas that have a disparate impact uh, for minorities, uh, meaning that if for some reason this area is mostly white people or something, uh, that the government can step in and say, uh, you know, you, you, we have to put in, uh, you know, uh, government housing and uh, low income housing in this area, subsidize homes into this area, uh, and, and they mandate it. Uh, so. Let, let's look at the same – this ammo tax, is a, as a, it's a racist policy, honestly, and I didn't think about it until you mentioned that. It is honestly racist because the people that, that live in income, uh, low-income areas uh, are, for the most part, and you know, as, as far as uh, uh, racial uh, uh, breakdowns go, there's a lot of minorities in these low-income areas. So there is a disparate impact that this law will have on minorities, and uh, that could potentially be challenged in that way too. I, I think that was a really good point. So, uh, it, yes. so, so, what was the other one? I, I know that there was. They're trying to repeal uh, the state preemption. Is is there another one other than that? That that was the the state preemption is the uh, the last one I have on the list that we've identified here right now is the uh, uh, for the anti ones. I have a couple of pro ones too, but uh, but that's no! the last one on the anti ones. Uh, all right, get, give me give me what the the pro ones are. Are these something that you guys are trying to get through, or is this something that's uh, another effort? Uh, on the pro ones. One, so we have a, a fix to the uh, short barrel rifle law, uh, which was passed two years two years ago. We passed, uh, we were able to get a uh, short barrel rifle law uh, uh, legislation written to allow short barrel rifles in Washington. 
uh, of course, they're still subject to the federal tax. Uh, however, with the way that the law itself is written, they can't be manufactured and assembled. So people have to buy them already made. Okay. Uh, rather than rather than uh, you know, and, and the AR-15, I mean, it's the most popular sporting rifle in America. Uh, it's real common for people to to want to go ahead and put a uh, to to obtain a short barrel rifle to get a short barrel for those, put a short barrel on them, uh, and they can't do that uh, currently with the way that the the law is written. Uh, this one here, it it wasn't apparent right away. It wasn't until people started filing for those tax stamps, uh, which they seemingly were going through all of the paperwork that they needed to and, and uh, following all the rules, and the ATF was sending letters back and saying, no, you can't do that. Uh, so we are, uh, uh, we put, you know, I, I contacted several of the representatives, and uh, I believe it was uh, Representative Brian Blake uh, that went ahead and uh, wrote up the changes. I had submitted some I had submitted to them some suggested, you know, on the way I was suggesting the changes. Uh, I don't think that they're identical to what I submitted, but, you know, essentially the same thing. Uh, you know, his team, his team got on it uh, and put it together. Uh, several of our representatives on our, uh, in our corner have, uh, have signed on to that bill uh, to try and get that one through to correct the manuf manufacturing issue. So that's basically a fix to, to a law that was passed two years ago. Uh, and then the second one, uh, Representative Linda Wilson, uh, who is representative down here, a really new representative. Oh, she's been up there for a year now. This is a year or two for her. Uh, representative here in, uh, in Vancouver, uh, who has been right there by our side, uh, has put forth a bill to correct the problem with the uh, governor being able to confiscate firearms during a state, uh, a state of emergency. Mm -hmm. uh, that one there is one that's remained on the books for, for quite some time. We can't challenge it in, uh, in uh, Supreme Court because it has never been exercised. No one has ever ever uh, paid for that one. No one's ever been been done wrong by that one. So they can't, they can't uh, however, prove harm. We know, yeah, we know that, you know, down in New Orleans uh, that this has indeed happened. Um, so we're trying to trying to put put through a, uh, a fix to that to where that the governor will not be able to do that. I see. So, so essentially, the the way it comes down to you have to be in order to file a lawsuit, uh, you have to be able to show that you are a party that's been harmed. So, because no one has ever asserted that power, no one can actually say that they were actually harmed by it. Is is that right? Right. Okay. Correct. So, was was there any other pro gun legislation out there? Those those are the uh, those are the two pro ones. Okay. And then I don't know if you uh, if you were still going to hit the the preemption or not, but. Yeah, yeah. So, so it, why do you think that uh, there should be a, a state preemption exempting, or I'm sorry, preventing uh, cities from creating uh, more restrictive gun gun laws than the state it has? Why is that a good thing to to have a preemption? Well, I think I think it actually should be should be on a federal level, uh, as opposed to a state level. I don't think the the state should have these these rights to to create these laws at all, uh, because that right comes from above them. Uh, however, uh, as far as the state goes, having a, a good, strong state preemption law means that when I am in Vancouver or Spokane or Yakima or, or Olympia or Battleground or wherever I am in Washington, I don't have to worry about whether I'm running afoul of a, of a local law because there's one set of rules for everywhere in the state. Uh, when, there are, when, when those rules are such that you might run afoul by walking over a, an imaginary line between, well, we can use right across the river here as an example, walking into Multnomah County, uh, as soon as you walk into Multnomah County, the rules are different uh, from what they are when you're outside of Multnomah County. And when you have to worry about crossing a county line or a city line uh, as to whether you're going to run afoul of the law, you're going to be less likely to exercise the right in the first place. And that's where I have a real problem with 
allowing local governments to uh, to create these rules. Uh, their real purpose there is to chill the right by discouraging it, uh, discouraging the practice of it. Seems and, to be a uh, pretty common a theme. Problem. Yeah, it's, it seems to be a pretty common theme. If they're they're trying to assert these restrictions in order to chill the right, as you said, in order to discourage people from actually Correct. asserting. And I, I myself have have had this happen as well. I mean, who hasn't? Any gun owner who actually carries a daily life, you've had issues where you're you had to have that risk analysis in your head, like, well, you know, I, it's it's illegal in the state, but there's a state pre or it's illegal in this city, but they're or county, but there is a state preemption. So technically, I'm within my rights, and and, and you know, I, I'm I'm good to go. However, I don't know if the police officer I run across is going to give me a hard time, maybe arrest me. Who knows what could happen? We've all been there, and it does, in fact, discourage you. I've I've had plenty of times that I've been discouraged from carrying a firearm simply because I knew I was going to be crossing over some imaginary border. Uh, where I do have a disagreement with you, though, is that you know I, I believe that this country was uh, was founded where the states were supposed to have uh, certain rights, respective. And the United States Constitution, the federal Constitution, was intended to limit the federal government from restricting the rights in the Bill of Rights and to give the federal government their power. So uh, the Second Amendment, it protects you from the federal Congress and president and all that stuff from infringing upon your right to keep bare arms, whereas the state constitutions were designed to protect you from your state and local governments from infringing upon your, your rights as well from the state and local governments. Uh, but as far as uh, as far as the the Washington State uh, Constitution, it's actually uh, a better it 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 pr- protects your right to keep bare arms better than the United States Constitution does in its wording. You'd agree with that, right, Rick? Well, yes. The, the Washington Constitution, uh, the the uh, right to keep and bar- bare arms, is written up to be stronger. Uh, primarily, uh, the only difference is in the, instead of infringe, they use the word impair, but it's it's a, it says the right of the individual, in, though. Right, and it's not included, but it's not included with uh, another right to confuse the issue where the Second Amendment has the militia discusses, you know, that discusses the right of the militia and the right to keep and bear arms in the same place, and people try and use, try and tie those two together when they're, when they're two separate issues, and it's like our First Amendment. Uh, our First Amendment covers the right to right to free speech, the right to you know freedom of religion, uh, assemble, uh, etc. If they want to to try and tie the Second Amendment together like that to make it inclusive, then let's go back to the first and look at what would happen there. Does that mean that we only have a right to speak freely if we're in a church, if we're a member of the press, while we're petitioning the government? That would be the basically, you know, basically the same thing if we took and tried to do the same thing with the First Amendment. We know that's absurd. So, so with our Second, it is, we're discussing two rights in the Second Amendment, mm-hmm. just like the Third has more than you know. All of our all of our first ten amendments uh, were combined by Madison. In fact, it was that last draft where he combined them. Uh, the Second Amendment was written up as two separate ones until that last draft. Mm-hmm. As far as the the Washington State uh, Constitution, Section twenty four, the the right to keep or the right to bear arms, it states, and this is where it, why it is it is better, everyone, because it says the right of the individual citizen to bear arms in the defense of himself or the state shall not be impaired. Uh, so that is why it's it's better than the. the the Washington, I'm sorry, the federal constitution, because it's uh, it's actually recognizing the right of the individual citizen to bear arms. So, so it's, I mean, it's pretty clear cut that the state and local government cannot infringe upon this right without repealing this constitutional amendment. And uh, you know, you have states that are are trying to, uh, you know, create their own little uh, little tyrannies in their own little districts and stuff. Uh, the counties and all this stuff trying to actually limit and, and impair, it's pretty clear. The right of the individual citizen to bear in defense of himself or the state shall not be impaired. But what else could you call a law that is restricting somebody from carrying a gun? It, it, what else could you call it? Well, that's, that's impairing. There's no, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, anyway, uh, Rick, did you have any final thoughts? And I know you said you had another event that's going on. Uh, you want to blast out the, the information for that, tell everybody where they can show up, wh- how if they have an event link or anything for that, uh, anything you got for that? We have, uh, on, on Thursday, uh, we're calling it uh, Gun Bill Day in Olympia, and that is when a lot of these bills are going to be heard. We've got uh, four, uh, four of the 
the uh, gun control bills being heard, and one of the pro ones, the uh, the short barrel rifle one, is going to be heard on Thursday, this next Thursday. And so we've got an event out there encouraging everyone to get get uh, get up there to the Capitol. Uh, again, I know a lot of these people were out there on Friday. We're asking them to sacrifice another day and get up there for this one here because it's really important uh, to get there, testify. Uh, and I've, I've just uh, just recently, within the last few hours, learned that uh, apparently Mom's Demand Action is going to be that there that day too. That doesn't really surprise me much, but uh, but yes, they will be there too. The information on that can be found in, found in the uh, Facebook Gun Rights Coalition group uh, in the events there. Uh, posting the events. I've also posted up all these bills uh, along with some talking points on all of them uh, so that people can look at them. Uh, obviously, the, the talking points are not all inclusive. We, you know, it would take us another three hours to cover all the talking points for all of them. Uh, but I've tried to put ones that we, will resonate with, uh, with the general public uh, and that will resonate with these representatives. Uh, so we've worked on those, uh, and then I, w I wanted to, I just wanted to cover one more thing with you. Uh, you were talking about having, you know, having to make that decision when you walk out the doors, whether or not you're going to carry your firearm or whatever you're going to do. Uh, and I want to, I want to use this quote by uh, by an author, Robert Heinlein. Uh, I am free because I know that I alone am morally responsible for everything I do. I am free, no matter what rules surround me. I am, if I find them tolerable, I tolerate them. If I find them too obnoxious, I break them. I am free because I know that I alone am morally responsible for everything I do. That's a good quote. I like that one. Hey, who said that again? Uh, Robert Heinlein. Okay, cool. So uh, I went around... I went around in all my Facebook and uh, and uh, social media and stuff, and I shared out the gun rights, uh, their gun build uh, day in Olympia link for the event, everyone. Uh, so please check that out. That's uh, facebook.com slash on the move show. Uh, or I'm sorry, yeah, slash on the move show. And if you want to join uh, the Gun Rights Coalition group, group on Facebook. That is facebook.com slash groups slash gun rights coalition. And uh, Rick, I really appreciate you joining us. Thanks so much, man. Certainly, certainly. All righty. Well, take care. Anyway, guys, at this point, we're going to cut to a uh, quick commercial break. When we come back, we've got some things that uh, i got some corrections I need to make, uh, some things that I've said and some of the things that, uh, that we covered already. Uh, I want to, uh, Some listeners have gave me some corrections, so I appreciate that, and we're going to cover that. I also want to cover some stuff you guys have sent me on uh, Twitter and some things you said on the Facebook event link and uh, on uh, our Facebook uh, event itself. So anyway, uh, we'll be right back after this break. Don't go anywhere. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, pledging my life, my fortune, and my sacred honor. So help me God. Join us at OathKeepers.org. on the move help us make this podcast bigger and better you can do this by going to our store and purchasing one of our hundreds of products all designs are original and made for patriots like you just go to cafepress.com slash on the move show we appreciate your support Hi, I'm Latasha Worley, and I work with candidates to creatively and effectively communicate their message to voters. I offer professional graphic design services, from yard signs to flyers, from logos to vehicle magnets. Email me today at latashaworley at gmail.com. That's L-A-T-O-S-H-A, worley at gmail.com, for a quote on items for your campaign. Broadcasting from deep within the heartland of free America, where liberty still shines bright, you're listening to On the Move with Mac Worley III. All right, we're back. 
So, very first thing, let's lead with the corrections. Uh, I just want to correct what I had said here. D, uh, she informed me on Facebook that uh, Walmart was not closing down 269 stores uh, nationally. Uh, it's That's globally. So, I apologize for that, gang. Uh, in fact, nationally, it's only 154. So, nothing to worry about. Only the one of the biggest companies. Companies in America closing down 154 stores nationally and 269 globally. Nothing to worry about here. Nothing to see. Everyone, go about your business. Nothing to see here. Uh, and then, in addition here, uh, Dan Sandini, he uh, he was showing me a 99 cent per gallon uh, link, uh, and that was with a dollar off on a Sam's Club discount. So that makes sense. Okay, so he was paying a dollar 99 out there in the Pacific Northwest. I just saw the other day dollar 59. Dollar 59. I haven't seen prices like that. Wow. Uh, I don't think since I started driving. Uh, it, like, it, I lived in Ohio, so, you know, the prices weren't California high. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine. He's still back on the West Coast, and he was saying, uh, you know, he, he saw like, a, I think, a dollar seventy or dollar eighty out there in the Pacific, uh, Pacific Northwest, and he was saying that's the cheapest he's ever seen in his lifetime because he lived in, uh, in California growing up. So he was used to paying out the wazoo. But I remember back when I first started driving, I would not fill up my, my gas uh, if it was above $1.79. I was like, it'll go back down. No, I'm just not going to, I'm just not going to fill it up. I'll just, I would always, I always fill up my, uh, I've, I guess I've been a prepper all my life when it comes to this. Um, I would always fill up and always have filled up my gas tank when I'm at a half a tank. I always consider it, I always say, if you're at a half tank, you're empty. So, you know, I knew that in the next few days, if I could drive around on a half tank, I got a little uh, economy car. So, you know, I, I sometimes go, you know, three three weeks a month w- without filling up my gas tank, no problem. So, and I, it only takes, I think I have like a 10 and a half gallon tank. So, you know, it, it, it only, it takes like less than 20 bucks for me to fill up my gas tank now, I think. So, uh, that's, that's pretty awesome. I remember those days and I cannot believe that they're back, but, uh, I don't believe it they're long for this world, folks. I don't believe it they're long. So uh, let's uh, let's go to some some things that you guys said here on, on the link in our uh, f- uh, on our uh, group, the On the Move uh, with Mac Worley group. That's uh, facebook.com slash groups slash On the Move show. Uh, we have some uh, activity on that. Dan Sandini, he's talking about his his gas. Um, his his gas uh, prices that he got fourteen seventy three for fourteen gallons or fourteen point seven four gallons of gas. Uh, uh, that's pretty awesome. He's posting some pictures of that. As I said, D corrected me on the uh, Walmart stores closing. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and within the actual event link, uh, we have some activity here. So let's. I'm gonna go and read some of the stuff that that we have. Uh, Dan, he's telling us that, that uh, on the second hour, I'm actually conflicting with Bernie and Hillary. Uh, it, I'm. I, I know that they're doing a debate, but uh, I, I'm. I'm not really interested. Honestly, I'm not interested in listening. And then my wife, uh, who's not into politics, by the way, before she went to work today, she was like, hey, um, are you planning on watching the, the Democrat national debate? And I was like, no, not today. Uh, first of all, I'll be on there. But second of all, uh, I've realized I've watched a couple of these already. And um, I'm basically it's them arguing about how they're going to spend other people's money. So that doesn't really interest me you know that people that's one thing about the left is that they're really, really generous with other people's money. You ever notice that? They don't really do a whole lot of uh, putting their money where their mouth is, though. Uh, so Dan also goes on in the uh, the Facebook event. He says, uh, buy some gold as a hedge uh, just in case the monetary system goes tits up. Not much. About 1% of your total net worth. I, I would definitely agree. I, I think that's a, a, a good option. Honestly, you know, I my net worth is uh, is sparse. So I I've already uh, in years past I've already uh, invested in some gold and some silver. So uh, you know I have a very limited amount uh, of it. Uh, but I, I definitely think that it's a good hedge. I, honestly, with what's coming around the corner, I think one of the 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 most valuable things that you can have, the most valuable commodity that you can have, is a skill, because there's going to be a, a big cascading. That's going to happen through the economy. If one thing goes bad, which many, many things are going to go bad, uh, if we start to see a lessened demand of, of consumer purchases, if, if there's less people spending, the, the economy goes to a standstill, um, this will cascade out to other areas of the economy. I mean, we're not just talking about the, the, the stock markets, the auto loan markets, the housing markets. If people are really struggling and you don't have money or the money you have is devalued to the point where you can't buy anything, uh, imagine what 
and this this is back to the feature topics that we were talking about. You know what you need to expect to expect. What do you what should you look out for next? You know, ask yourself: Is your job recession proof? Is it Great Depression proof? Is, does your job is it always going to be there no matter what? Uh, you know, are, are are you essentially selling air? You know, is 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 it a necessity? You know, is what you're doing really first of all uh, in demand? And will people always need it? And you're, we're going to start to see things like jobs that people uh, are in that are, I don't want to use the word frivolous. Uh, let's see here. Um, discretionary spending, so to speak. Okay. So like, for example, if you're in a entertainment industry uh, or if you're in a, uh, <laughs> and this is something that, that affects my family family uh my my mother she's in a uh a, a career field right now uh in in fitness she's a physical trainer uh so uh i i would imagine that if if things get tight that industry is probably not going to exist uh, gyms are going to go by the wayside the you know very very first thing people already do uh when they're trying to cut some fat out of their their uh, budget is cut out like stuff like gym memberships and things like that so if you don't even have a budget and you can't even you can't spend a dollar you know those kind of those kind of businesses are going to go belly up. I I I'm just putting it out there, and I'm not. This is my prediction. You know, I I, I think that we're going to see a huge shift, and and this is why it's so important that you make yourself marketable now. Find a way if you have somebody who you can pick their brain, get some knowledge out, get some skills from. If if you have somebody who will show you how to turn a wrench, something that you can physically do. You know, uh, welding. Something I mean, uh, and again, I'm I'm preaching to myself here as well. You know, I I need more skills. You know, I I have I have some skills, but I I don't have enough. I need more. I need more skills. Uh, so I think I think that's going to be one of the most valuable resources that we have. Uh, but let's ask. Uh, and and in fact, uh, let me see here. We have uh, this is kind of carry over to the gun control. Uh, debate uh, conversation we were just having uh, with Rick. Uh, Mark on Twitter, he tells us, uh, he says, at On The Move Show, silly conservatives, they'll never come after your guns. Well, unless you live in Georgia. Then he sent me a link to a Brett Bart, Ar- Brett Bart, Bright Bart article. There we go. Bart, 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 Bart. Uh, he sent me a link to that. And uh, and anyway, uh, first of all, uh, hat tip to Mark. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And um, Let's see here. Uh, the article on Breitbart is uh, titled, Georgia Democrats introduce, introduce Assault Weapon Confiscation Bill. On January 11th, Democrats in Georgia's state house introduced a bill that bans assault weapons and opens the door for the seizure of such weapons, along with accessories like high-capacity magazines, which how in the world are you going to do that? How are you going to track down high-capacity magazines? Who all owns it? It's impossible. They don't even they don't even track that. There's no. It's not like you have a background check or something for it. And even if you did, imagine going. How many times the uh, national instant uh, or the national instant uh, uh, background check system? How how many times that would be hit just for uh, high capacity quote unquote magazines? Uh, that would that would bog that system down even more than it already is. So. Uh, anyway, this bill is uh, HB 731. is sponsored by Mary Margaret Oliver uh, and Stacey Abrams, Carolyn Hughley, Pat Gardiner, Deshun Kendrick, and D. Dawkins Hagler. According to the text of HB 731, the bill focuses on danger, dangerous instrumentalities. What the heck does that mean? Instrumentalities and practices by prohibiting the possession, sale, transport, distribution, or use of certain assault weapons, large capacity magazines, armor piercing bullets, and incendiary 50 caliber bullets. So uh, before I finish reading the rest of this text, let me ask you guys, you know, uh, the people that are able to do actually buy real assault weapons, full auto weapons, sorry, again, and cost tens of thousands of dollars, and it's already been prohibited federally, and it's very difficult to get. It's hard to get your hands on. Uh, very restricted federally. Uh, so, in these large capacity magazines, are what, what is large? That is a very, um, very subjective word. What is large to one person may not be large to another. You know, so thirty round magazines to me not very large. You know, I, when I was in the military, I, I I issued out hundreds and hundreds of these so-called 
large 30-round capacity magazines every single day. That's not large to me. Uh, I got 30-round magazines. That's not large to me. Uh, Armor-piercing bullets. Okay. Uh, And and incendiary 50-caliber bullets. Look, those already cost a lot. I think it's like $10 for a normal 50-caliber bullet. Uh, So, and I guess if you're going to call that normal... (laughs) But anyway, it's already like ten bucks a bullet from what from what I remember. I was looking into that. Uh, but if you can buy a fifty cal, which is extremely expensive again, uh, and you can afford the ammunition, it's if if you're trying to actually create a law that would prohibit people from getting it, uh, they have the money to find it on the black market. Again, this is this is the thing about these laws is that. This doesn't prohibit the people that will actually get the guns, get the ammo, get the weaponry. Again, even, like I said, with tanks, and you can extend this all the way up to nuclear weapons, all right? This is the, the left's, this is their, their big straw men that they're like, whoa, you don't think that, uh, that people should be allowed to have nuclear weapons, do you? Oh my goodness, what's wrong with you? I don't think that there should be a law prohibiting people from ha- from buying nuclear weapons. I don't I don't I don't think it should be an issue. It, 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 because anybody who wants to obtain a nuclear weapon has a ton of money at their disposal. We're talking loads and loads and loads. And with that kind of money they can afford to go buy it on the black market anyway and you can't stop them. They'll figure it out. That's why it's it's ineffective. The only way to actually make sure that people aren't getting weapons that they shouldn't be getting or something along those lines or and again, what is a weapon that you shouldn't be getting? I don't I don't think there is a weapon you shouldn't be getting. I think we should all be able to have access to weapons uh you know, based upon free market prices and that way it prevents other people from trying to get these weapons in order to control us, hurt us, steal from us, you know, it, things along those lines. That's that's what you're doing when you create gun laws. You're, in fact, hurting the people who can't afford the things that, that you're prohibiting in the first place. Again, the, the poor can't buy tanks. All right? All you're doing is making uh, this a, 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 an item that only the privileged elite can have. That's all you're doing. And, in fact, it's racist. It has a disparate impact on minorities. So, again... The people that are supporting this, among the left, the status left, they are, in fact, as I previously said, they are praising the people who are making their chains heavier. The racist Democrats. And before they were overtly racist in, throughout history, again, they were, the, they were the, the party of slavery, they were the party of, uh, of segregation, the Democrats. All right? They, they were the ones, the, the, the Democratic sheriffs in the South, those are the ones that were spraying African Americans with water hoses, sending out attack dogs, spraying them with pepper spray, beating them with batons, and killing them in the street for having the audacity to assemble. Those were the Democrats. Those weren't Republicans. Somehow Republicans have been made out to be the uncool racist party. The, the party of the racist you know, big business white guys. That's what the that's what the Republican Party has been made out to be. When in fact it's the Democrats, and now they have rallied their base of people, and they're covertly using their their power and influence to to oppress their own people with the support of their own people. Unbelievable, it's unbelievable. Back to this Breitbart article here. Uh, the details punishment for crimes involving the possession, sale, transportation, distribution, or Use of certain assault weapons, large capacity magazines, or uh, uh, armor piercing bullets, and incendiary 50 caliber bullets. So it, it talks about um, the punishment uh, for crimes involving these things. So it also designates uh, uh, certain weaponry and ammunition as contraband and requires seizure of, uh, seizure of such by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. Representative Mary Margaret Oliver suggests. Ten other representatives have joined the six original bill sponsors, and an announcement proposed to Oliver's website says, Oliver and 15 Democrat women House members introduced HP 731 on the the first day of 2016 set of this 2016 session the bill bans assault weapons and, and high capacity magazines georgia needs debate about these weapons which are only uh, which are only used for rapidly killing people assault weapons are not necessary for deer hunting the, okay, okay all right uh, let's be clear uh, the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed and it doesn't say anything about hunting and uh, that that 
that whole thing, you know, the, the right to keep and bear arms, it's not about fluffing your pillows or it doesn't help you put on your makeup or it doesn't go buy your groceries. It kills people. They're not talking about how quickly you can kill people. Uh, they, they're talking about killing people. That's, that's what guns do. That's what they're designed to do. And again, as any tool, tools have purposes. And sometimes people misuse tools. The answer is to punish the people who misuse the tools, not prevent everyone else in society from having access to the tool. It's ridiculous. And, in fact, this woman is talking about how this is for women. All right, These are uh, Oliver and 15 Democrat women. Women are, <laughs> are one of the very people that benefit from having access to firearms. Now, look, I, I'm, I'm not saying that women are inferior, all right? But let's be honest. Men are stronger than women physically for the most part. Now, again, the strongest woman may be able to whoop my butt, and that's fine, all right? There, there may be exceptions to that rule. But the vast majority of women are physically less strong than men, and I don't think that's offensive. And I'm not going to fall, fall prey to this leftist status political correct madness where they demand that I accept things that are false. They demand that you say things that you know clearly are not correct or true. So they want you to say that we're equal. All the sexes are equal. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. We're completely equal. All right. In every way. All right. I'm, I'm sorry. It's just not true. And I'm not going to, to, to say things things that I know to be false. I'm just, I'm not. And you can call me a sexist, a bigot, or whatever. I don't care. All right. The, the point is, is that I'm speaking truth here. All right. If you don't like it, uh, maybe, maybe you got an issue with the truth. But uh, look, women are, are not physically as strong as men for the most part. Again, there are exceptions, but this is a fact that everyone knows to be true. All right. Which is, why women, of all people, stand to gain the most from having access to firearms so that they don't become victims of violent crime, of men trying to hurt, hurt them, just like old people uh, stand to gain significantly by ha having access to firearms so they themselves don't become the same victims that we were just talking about. So this is a victim mentality. They, they, it's, there's no one out there claiming to be for gun violence. There's no pro-gun violence movement out there, folks. There's, there's people who say that guns save lives, and there's people that say, let's disarm everyone, and I don't really care if, if, if you know, violent crime goes up, because our, our goal here is not to prevent crime, not to stop violent crime, it's to take away guns. Because there is no correlation between gun laws and reducing crime. Now, if you can, you can argue that it would reduce the amount of gun deaths, and, and that may be true. But that doesn't mean that violent crime will go down. If somebody's looking to do harm to another person, they don't need a gun to do it. You can do it with a hammer. You can do it with a bat. You can do it with your fist or a knife. What are you going to do? Are you going to ban all those things? It's not possible. But the left, that's where it will go. It will just continue to go and go and go. Because again, what one generation accepts, the other embraces. And that's because we're living in a state of society here, folks, where, again, I live by a moral code. The, the non-aggression principle. That's the moral code that I, I, I live by. I, I try not to hurt anybody else. And I try not to take any other things. It's a pretty simple code to understand. You just don't commit aggression against other people. All right? I can't force you to do anything. I can't take your things without your consent. It's pretty simple. But what the state is, what is their philosophy? What, what is their moral code? They don't have one. They would have you believe that, that you're a, a clinger, clinging to your God and your Bible if you have some kind of moral code that guides your actions. What guides their actions? The government. What does the government say is okay? So, again, what one generation says is okay, what they accept, the next embraces. So, there used to be a time when... You know, people, people would, let's, let's go for the easy one here, abortion, okay? Uh, I know a lot of people don't, don't like talking about it. There's a lot of emotions on both sides, but let's just point out the fact that when the Democrats first started pushing abortion, all right, they said it was supposed to be safe, legal, and rare. Safe, legal, and rare. 
Now this is considered a, a God-given right. It's a God-given right. Among the left, anyway. This is their sacred cow. It has, it has been transformed from something that is that was supposed to be safe, legal, and rare. Emphasis on rare. To something that anybody can do. You can do it as many times as you want. You have a right to it. And on top of that, you have a right to other people's money in order to provide a service to do that abortion. It's inherently immoral. Inherently. But as one generation accepted it, the next embraced it, and now demanded. This is the natural tendency. This is why, why I say so many times we have to stop compromising with these people. We have to. Because little by little, they build upon their wins. And even things that we do that try to fight back. All right, I just want to point out an example here, okay? If we have a, a law that, that is bad, and we pass another law that fixes one of the bad components, but rem leaves two other bad components, that is a bad thing. Because we are still compromising. Even if we don't think that we could win on the other two components, we have to be uncompromising at every step. We have to be. Because if we don't, they will eke further and further and build further and further upon it. Every time we concede a point, we give that ground over to them. And once the government says that they have this, this power, this ability to regulate that right or this and this way or that, once we concede that point, it is built upon because, again, we accept it and then embrace it. That is a status agenda. So it doesn't surprise me that Georgia Democrats are trying to, this is happening all over the country now, uh, create assault weapons ban. But it's concerning that there's language in the bill, apparently, according to this article. I didn't read anything in the article that talks about uh, them confiscating it. But, uh, I don't know, the headline from Breitbart says that uh, it opens a door for seizure of such weapons. And seizure would imply that they're they're coming to your home. They're kicking in your door and they're taking it from you. So I find that very concerning because uh, first of all, uh, you don't have a, a, a right to do that. Uh, we have a fourth amendment right that protects us against you doing that unlawful search and seizure. And we also have this right to these firearms. So it, it's very concerning. I don't know what Georgia's state constitution looks like, but I'm willing to bet they have a provision carved out for the right to keep and bear arms. And, and uh, if they do, then they're in violation of their state constitution. So, and, and uh, these these uh, Democrats are violating their oath of office. But hey, that apparently is no big deal, right? No big deal at all. So, I, I want we got a couple minutes here. We got 14 minutes left in the show. Le uh, all right, so let me cover first the Walmart closing stores. That Walmart closes 269 stores as retail struggle. Uh, they're about ready to uh, shut down. Uh, according to this article, um, the correction from D said 159 in the United States. Oh, I'm sorry. No, 154. She was right. Uh, uh, the giant retailer based in Bentonville, Arkansas, said in a statement that it would shutter 154 stores in the United States or about 3% of its lo locations, as well as 115 stores overseas. It will also end its Walmart Express store, uh, small store format, which failed to catch on in urban areas as many as 10,000 employees could lose their jobs in the United States and 6,000 elsewhere it added so okay we're losing jobs we're losing jobs and by the way you know not exactly high paying jobs but these are part of the service industry sector jobs that have been you know growing in the United States that Obama administration is telling us oh no oh, we got all these jobs that we're creating doesn't mention the fact that uh, you know these are service industry jobs but hey that we're losing service industry jobs right there. A lot of people going to be unemployed. Um, and uh, let's see here. What are some other things? Oh, you know what? It, I, I mentioned earlier, and I don't think I, I, fin I got to finish this point here. As far as what's happening with, with the Federal Reserve increasing the interest rates, like I said, one of two things are going to happen, and I never got to finish this point, the two things. I went way off the rails. I was way out in the weeds. So let me cover this point here. I, I think they're leaving the door open for attack, and I've talked about all the stuff here relating with ISIS, and, and obviously, you know, the, the immigration issue, that uh, that they're bringing in thousands of these, these refugees, and again, it's very concerning to bring these people in, even if we vet them, which the, the vetting process is a freaking joke. The San Bernardino attack that took place uh, uh, about a month or so back, 
that that took place. The the woman was coming from Saudi Arabia, and she was vetted. She was vetted. Very likely, she was probably vetted better than these refugees are being vetted. Because how do you vet somebody who doesn't have any identification? They, they don't have any ID. They just left their home. All the guys are closing their back. How do you vet that person? And how do you vet to make sure that this person isn't an extremist? If you don't have their name in a database, if, if they've never been caught, if they've never been associated with a known terrorist organization, how do you vet that? It only makes sense to, to prevent people from coming into the country uh, that ha, from nations that have ties to terrorist organizations, that have extremist movements uh, that are growing and out of control in these areas. And, and I think that should even extend. Now, we should prohibit people from coming to this country from, from Europe as well because – Europe's being overrun. By the way, it's the rape capital of the world now, everyone. Rape capital of the world because these guys, uh, these Arab men think that they can just rape women. They can just rape women uh, because, first of all, uh, you know, women are subjugated uh, in that that society, that religion of Islam. They, if you believe in the literal interpretation of the Hadith and the Quran, again, I say this very frequently, you think that it's the revealed word of a God. God, then you believe that it is okay to rape a woman who is showing her skin because she's not acting modest and she tempted you. you not that you, you should, you know, have some self-restraint. Come on, guy. You know, you should have a little self-restraint, but it's, it's okay to rape her because she's not really a real person. She's, she's a lesser person. I have a fundamental problem with that, the Sharia law. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, it's okay to rape an infidel, somebody who doesn't believe in, in, in Islam, because they're not real people either. You know, the, you, can, you can rape them, you can murder them, you can enslave them, because they're not real. They're infidels. And it's better to kill an infidel than to allow them to continue living. That, it's, be, it's humane as far as the way that they believe it. That, that's what they believe. That, that's more humane to kill an infidel than to allow them to live. So I believe that the Obama administration is leaving us open for attack. They're leaving the door open. They're letting the, the borders wide open. And they're going to blame the attack that will happen. This is going to be a 9-11 style attack or worse. They're going to blame the, the crash that is impending. The, uh, the global Great Depression that is around the corner. They're going to blame that on the attack. Which they're leaving the door open for. In addition, they funded, created, trained and armed ISIS. And the, they're they're actually helping ISIS. I mean they're not they're not doing anything serious about defeating ISIS. So anybody who tells you that we need to get involved in Syria to destroy them, I would agree that we could from the air destroy team up with Russia. I I know they're not the greatest guys. Team up with Russia to destroy ISIS. I'm for it. However, I don't trust this government to do it, so we need to get the hell out of Syria. Stay away. Russia can take care of that. Let them spend their money. We know that Russia has a, an interest, a self-interest in making sure that Assad stays in power. Let them take care of it. It's not our job. We're not the world police. People are responsible for their own governments. Again, the Syrian people, yeah, it's, it sucks that many people are dying. Many people are dying over there, and that sucks. It's not good. But that's not our fault. Well, I guess technically, in a lot of ways, it is. But you know what? What what are we gonna do? Are we gonna are we gonna put ourselves on the line to fight for people that don't care about us and aren't not willing to fight for their own country? This is a continuing trend that we've seen in in the Middle East. All right, we try to build up, we try to spread democracy. All right, we we messed up. We destabilized the whole region. We get it. So now let's get out. Let's leave it alone. Let's. I'm not saying we leave Afghanistan. Because we're already there, and it's going to destabilize that, that region even worse, and that's only going to benefit ISIS. But we, we stop trying to do nation building. We stop, we stop getting ourselves involved in conflicts and doing what uh, ISIS actually wants. ISIS wants us to get into this quagmire, the graveyard for civilizations known as the Middle East. Afghanistan goes by that, but I mean, it, it could apply to the whole Middle East. Because they want us to spend ourselves into oblivion. And it's exactly what we've done. We got eighteen and a half trillion dollars in debt. It's time to get out of there. It sucks that the people of Syria are dying, but this is their fight now. We we've screwed it up. We 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 realize this now. And if 
If Russia can destroy ISIS, great. And I think Russia has a vested interest to do so. But uh, as far as the other option, if, if this administration, if this collapse doesn't happen after an attack, I think that they're going to try to do, this, uh, this Obama administration, I think they're going to try to stave it off as long as they possibly can until Obama gets out of office. And then once he's out of office, he'll blame it on the next guy. Say, oh, well, look, uh, you know, w w it didn't happen on my shift, and uh, it's it's just because they didn't know how to do it right. You, you had the wrong guys in control, especially if you're talking about a Ted Cruz, Ted Cruz presidency. It's going to be more difficult if it's a Hillary, but I don't think he's going to he's going to care much because, uh, again, Obama and Hillary they have no love loss. You all, you have to remember that Hillary is the one that created the birther rumor uh, about Obama. So they don't like each other, but Obama does realize that his legacy is contingent upon Hillary. Because if Ted Cruz gets into office, all of his, his work, <laughs> his work to undermine this country's infrastructure, this country's economy, this country's military, and this country's liberty, all of it will be undone. Or at least, hopefully, if we're lucky, it will be undone. And, uh, you know, this show has... Has uh, of course uh, gone way further than what, uh, as far as uh, time, we didn't get to cover uh, what a Ted Cruz uh, or Hillary uh, Hillary Clinton presidency would look like, or the global citizen movement uh, versus a realist global uh, geo uh, geopolitical worldview. Again, I will cover that. I promise you guys, I'm going to cover that uh, next week at the top of the first hour. So uh, we're going to cover that first. Let me, since I since we got five minutes left in the show here. I want to talk about how people survived the Great Depression, okay? So what are some valuable lessons that we can learn from the Great Depression? And uh, here's an article. This is on frugalconfessions.com. The article is dated uh, January 17th, 2011 by Amanda. It's kind of like Madonna, no last name. Um, so uh, the article asks the question, how did people survive the Great Depression. And uh, it goes on here. It says, uh, before I list some of the examples I found in my research, let's put everyone into the mindset of a depression area. Imagine this. The stock market has crashed and your money is in it is gone. The value on your home is plummeted. That may not be difficult to imagine for some. You see a line forming outside several banks and begin to wonder if you should get your own money out of them and stuff it into a mattress. Your job cuts your wages by 25%, but you feel fortunate to still have one. Except that six months later, consumer demand is, is a spectacle of what it used to be, so your job enforces furloughs. Unfortunately, the money you had set aside in your bank is not liquid at the moment due to bank issues. What do you do? So, how did people survive the Great Depression? Uh... One way that they did it is they sold apples on the corner. The Pacific Northwest apple growers had a surplus of apples and decided to sell and crate, uh, crate them to unemployed people at $1.75 per crate. Selling 60 to 72 apples on the street corner would yield $3. And after paying Pacific, a person could reap around $1.25. Many people rolled their own cigarettes. Uh, they ate food from the wild, such as delic uh, delicacies uh, like blackberries, dandelions, and game, uh, uh, and game were for the taking in the country, but not in the city. Other people gathered corn kernels found in fields and roasted them over fires or picked fruit from other people's trees. Uh, they're saying that they don't suggest that you do this. Um, substituting other things for meat. Families ate more beans, macaroni and cheese, pancakes, and other gut-filling foods that were less expensive than meats. One type of meat that became popular was sardines, introducing the mashed sardine and mayonnaise sandwich. That sounds delicious. Mm -mm. Family members worked uh, work uh, to supplement income, including mowing lawns, shoveling snow, delivering newspapers, babysitting, shoe shining, passing out ads. By the way, shoe shining, that's going to be hard to come by nowadays. Uh, selling door-to-door, -door, mining, etc. Mining is going to be difficult because uh, uh, the mining industry is, con is seeing consecutive losses in jobs. The Obama administration is doing their best to stifle that. Uh, let's see. Uh, repairing your own clothing with objects. Uh, clothing with objects around the house, giving up your telephone, postponing life decisions, uh, practicing out of your home like doctors, dentists, and other professionals. Instead of renting law offices, they did it out of their house. Uh, left the city to farm so they could, knew they could at least eat. Uh, giving up their car and instead opting for bicycles. Uh, making use of your neighbors and vice versa. You guys help each other out. Live and sleep 
sleep anywhere. People living in their cars or in other people's homes. People uh, communally coming together. People pawn their, their belongings, using socks for gloves. Uh, they traded work for food, joined a food co-op, and they moved in with other families. This is, uh, this is all the stuff that you could do with this impending economic collapse. I just wanted to bring it up tail end of the show here with that said uh, we got to take off um, don't forget to join us every week we broadcast every sunday at 5 p.m pacific standard time it's 8 p.m eastern standard time here at on the move show.com you can also follow us on spreaker.com slash on the move show you can like us on facebook.com slash on the move show follow us on twitter at on the move show and uh please uh please uh, uh please subscribe to us uh, on youtube.com forward slash on the move show and uh as always know your rights assert your rights and get on the move.